The live broadcast of the Minneapolis Budget Committee for December 3rd will now begin. Good morning. My name is Lene Palmisano. I'm the chair of the Budget Committee, and I'm going to call to order this regular committee meeting for Friday, December 3rd. I'd like to note for the record, this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under Minnesota Open Meeting Law, section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. I will also note the city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to Minnesota Open Meeting Law. Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Reich. Present. Gordon. Here. Cunningham. Present. Ellison. Present. Osman. Goodman. Present. Jenkins. Here. Cano. Here. Bender. Here. Schrader. Here. Johnson. Here. Fletcher. Here. Councilmember Osman. Chair Palmasano. Present. There are 12 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect we have a quorum. Colleagues, the one and only piece of business before us today is to formally begin our work on Mayor Fry's 2022 recommended budget. Over the last several months, this committee has received a series of presentations to examine details of each department's budget requests. This committee and the City Council have also held two public hearings on this budget as well, and we will hold a third hearing next week, Wednesday, December 8th, starting at 6.05 p.m. I want to start with an overview of the process I intend to follow for this meeting. You, there are amendments, an amendment packet, and they are ordered and sent to all council members. After we go through a brief update about our financial policies, we will go and proceed through these proposed amendments one by one. We will display each amendment on the screen for the viewing public uh, and for my colleagues, and the entire amendment packet will be added to LIMS, the Legislative Information Management System, once this meeting is adjourned. I do expect our work today will extend into the lunch hour, so I may recess the meeting to allow for a 30-minute lunch break. If we don't finish our work today or if staff feel they need time to do technical cleanup to changes we make today, we will meet again on Monday, December 6th at 1.30 p.m., as is on our calendars and noticed for the public as a continuation of today. Do any of my colleagues have questions about how we're going to run today? All right, well, before we get to the prepared amendments packet, we have updates to financial policies. These are usually smashed into Wednesday night adoption and you know we read them quickly and they don't get a lot of airtime. Um, I have asked Director Kruver just to give us an overview. It's very short, I promise. Director Kruver. Thank you, Chair Palmisano. So exactly as you just heard, every year we update our financial policies and then we uh, adopt them with our overall adoption of the budget. I just wanted to update you on four changes that we're making that are a little bit more substantive. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The first is a change to our current service level calculation. So right now, how we have put together the budget and what our financial policies dictate says that we start with the expenses for our internal service departments. So these are departments like IT, rent, uh, fleet services. We start with those expense budgets and then we distribute the charges to all of our um, general fund departments and customer departments according to specific cost drivers, and then those budgets are automatically added as a starting point for the budget process. This would make a slight change to say that we would automatically add increases that are up to an inflationary amount. Any increases that are larger than inflationary would be, would be pulled out of that automatic process and would be handled the way we handle similar changes in spending, whereas increases are higher than, like I said, a regular inflationary amount. So uh, if that were to happen, if there's something going on that's driving costs to increase 
larger than inflation, then departments would need to find that uh, budget within their discretionary funds in their own budget, or that would show up as a change item in the budget process. So again, this just adds a step that if there are large increases, we're gonna pull that out of the automatic process of calculating the current service level and bring it up into either a change item discussion or a decision point for department heads. The next budget is just sort of codifying what we have been uh, practicing for the last year and a half. We're including questions about racial equity impact in all of our change items. And so this just adds that language to our financial policies. The third item is about overhead. Director Prover, if I could just pause you there and call on Council Member Gordon, who has a question. I could just use a little help understanding what we consider large atypical cost increases. Could you give us a, an example or two from last year or something like that so we understand what we're talking about? Yes, happy to. So one of the things that drive our increases in costs for internal service departments, I'll use IT as an example. Sometimes departments have specific software that they use that might have cost increases that are more than 5%, somewhere like 10% each year. So when that happens under our current policies, we just add those budgets to departments' uh, budgets as a starting place for the, for the budget discussion. What this would do is say, you know, if inflation is looking like it's around 4% increase for that year, we would pick that cost increase up go to the department and say, what's driving this increase? Let's, let's work with our internal service departments to see this is a specific software. Is there another software that we have maybe that we're already paying for that we could use instead? If that's not the case, departments can prioritize that, find space for it within their discretionary funds, or they can put it in a change item if it's critical to their business processes. So that, that would be one example I have sometimes that we are, um, specific uh, newer software sometimes increases in cost much higher than the rate of inflation. So that's an example and I'm happy to stand for more questions. All right, I will move on to the next one, which is about overtime. So our current financial policies have some conflicting language about using overtime in the budget. So we've removed the old language, um, one of which said, not to include overtime and personnel costs, one of which capped the amount of overtime we budget. And we've just replaced that language by saying each year, if departments would like to budget for overtime, they need a fresh analysis of the amount of overtime that they need. This just uh, will put a little bit more sunlight on the amount of overtime that we're budgeting for and will include rationale for the level of budget that we're including for overtime each year. And the last one is about the liability and workers compensation fund balance policies. So this update doesn't change the way we administer our liability or our workers compensation programs. This is just adjusting what we have as a target fund balance for these two sub funds. So right now in our self insurance fund, there's actually four different sub funds. Two of them are liability and workers comp. And our current financial policies have a policy for the target fund balance that is out of line with the rest of those funds. So this brings that back into line with the rest of the funds in the uh, self-insurance fund sort of basket. So current policy says that using our third party actuarial study, we should target to have all of our liabilities, enough funds to cover all of our liabilities for many years into the future as a target fund balance. What we're changing it to here is that we're going to still use that third party actuarial analysis and only target the amount that we expect to lose in the next calendar year as our fund balance um, target. And so this means we would still plan to collect revenues throughout the course of the year to handle payments. But in terms of our, our cushion that we are targeting to have an unreserved fund balance, we're only going to use next year's losses as our target rather than all of the liability that we may face in the next several years. So this again brings that policy in line with the rest of our self insurance funds and the rest of our uh, internal service funds in general. So those are my four updates to financial policies. Happy to stand for any other questions if you have them. Thank you. I do invite questions or discussion about this from my colleagues. Any concerns we would want to know well in advance. Um, 
this will be included in the general resolutions packet on Wednesday night for your approval. I'm not seeing any, so thank you. I think that was pretty straightforward and, um, you know, just kind of a summary. So with that, um, we will begin. Uh, I want to note from the clerk that the am amendments packet has been posted to LIMS at this time. And with that, we'll begin with the proposed amendments that are in front of us. I'll begin with the technical amendments and then the mayor's amendments. We have city staff on hand to answer questions you might have about them. I am certainly not the expert of these specific amendments. And after that, we'll move smoothly into the rest. Um, I will recognize the author of each amendment to introduce your own amendment. And then we will open the floor to discussion before taking a vote. Staff from the budget office as well as departments are on hand. And I will also ask our technical team to be sure that we're displaying each amendment as the author is introducing it so that the public can see what is being proposed. So uh, we'll start with item number one in these packets. And this is um, some of the, this is the more technical amendments piece. It's what we call the technical amendments piece. Um, instead of reading it all out loud to you, you'll see it has uh, parts A through M. Uh, and I will defer to Director Kruver, who can summarize this much faster than I can. So, Director Kruver. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. And if the clerk could scroll back up to the top, I'll get started. But the first two items address errors or omissions in the mayor's recommended budget. Uh, the ward budgets were reduced in 2021 as part of cost saving measures. In 2022, we are simply adding back 136,000. dollars for the ward budgets. I, the second item is a similar situation where we are restoring $113,000 in ongoing budget to the Civil Rights Department to cover labor standards co-enforcement. The remainder $86,000 will be one-time funds and that will be addressed in a later amendment. But together these two amendments will bring the overall budget for labor co-standards in civil rights or labor co-enforcement uh, in civil rights back up to $200,000, which is the rate that they had in the 2020 budget. So the next amendment corrects an error in the CPED budget. This reduces overall spending in the general fund by $250,000. This is related to transfers that CPED has going out of the general fund to the special revenue fund. And so that correction brought down spending by $250,000. It is offset by the increases in ongoing spending in the first two items. The next two items, D and E, relate to resolutions passed in between the release of the mayor's budget and now. It just catches up spending and revenue related to the downtown improvement district and the special service district. The la or item F just corrects a uh, transfer amount uh, related to the uh, CPED special revenue fund. The transfer was already accorded for, we just needed the second half of it to be in our budget data. The next one addresses the uh, resolution that was passed, again, in between the mayor's budget release and, uh, and now related to the uh, parks and streets ordinance. So that was updated through council and it increases spending in the park board on capital projects by a million dollars. So we've included that here. The next one addresses a special assessment bond in the Minneapolis Parks Board. These change every year and the Minneapolis Parks Board just asked for an adjustment as they work to address, uh, continue to address disease tree removal. If you can scroll down a little bit, thank you so much. The item I addresses the Art in Public Places program. Art in Public Places is meant to uh, be funded at an amount that is 1.5% of overall net debt bonds. And so this is just increasing that amount so that we are accurate in the percent we're budgeting for that program uh, as it relates to the increase in the um, park board that uh, capital spending that I just talked about. The next one is a, just a change in revenue. It's a neutral change, it's a net zero change, but we're lowering revenues into the debt service fund and increasing them into the capital fund. And this is just related to the timing of our bond sale this year. In order to collect revenue into our debt service fund, we need to have bond sales to tie all of that funding to. 
because we got a later start in bond sales this year, having just wrapped up the first one uh, last month, we expect that we will need to do a little bit more in 2022. And so these funds are being deposited into the capital projects fund until we have an actual bond sale to make those debt payments on, which we expect to do uh, in early next year. The next one is cleaning up revenue and spending in the neighborhoods and community relations special revenue fund. This is the 1800 fund. We have better information at this time of year than we did this summer on what we expect to see in rollover spending. So this is spending that has been previously allocated to neighborhoods that we are seeing spend down happening years later after it was appropriated. So we have better information. We're just updating our financial plans and our budget to reflect that. And the last one is just including a revenue source for the convention center, the target center specifically, including that team rent. This was something that was included in our financial plans, but not included in our budget data. So we're adding that uh, adjustment here. And that concludes the technical amendments. I'll stand for any questions. Any questions on this first technical amendment from my colleagues? I am making this motion. Could I have a colleague second this motion? Second. Thank you. Council Member Gordon seconds the motion. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just um, trying to understand what was the um, the item about the arts funding. Can you please just repeat that? I couldn't. You just said the next one and I couldn't tell which letter you are on. Sure. So this is about letter I and this is about the art program in CPED called uh, Art in Public Places. Percent of arts. Yes, or? that's right. So it should represent 1.5% and in the mayor's recommended budget, we had just held steady the amount from last year and this is just bringing them up to being truly 1.5% of net debt bond spending. So this is adding spending to make sure we're within that policy. All righty, thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing anything further from my colleagues. Um, so with that, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on motion number one. Uh, wait, actually, I might have spoken too soon. Um, Council Member Fletcher and then Gordon. Council Member Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, just a quick question on the uh, civil rights item, item B. Um, or I'm sorry, I'm. Am I getting ahead? Yeah. So the that item is restoring two hundred thousand. I think the previous year was two sixty nine. So can we just clarify? We're not actually restoring the. Uh, dollar amount to the amount that that was in the budget last year, correct? We are restoring it. So that's that extra sixty nine thousand dollars is in their budget right now. The cut was two hundred thousand dollars that happened. So that's the amount that we're restoring. And to complicate matters a little bit more, we're adding back one hundred and thirteen in ongoing spending in this technical amendment because that is the amount of resources that were freed up with that uh, correction in item C. In, an, in the next amendment, you'll see the addition of the remaining $86,000 in one-time sources. Got it, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Council Member Gordon. Yeah, can you help me understand? So there's a second motion that looks duplicative of this technical amendments. It in fact I includes the civil rights piece and some of these pieces. Um, I just don't quite understand why we're voting on this and then it looks like our next motion uh, number two, it has uh, similar matters. Can you just clarify? But it doesn't have all of them, I don't think. Yes. Great question, and it is a confusing um, sort of series of amendments, so I'm happy to clarify. In this technical amendment, when we corrected for the error in CPEDS budget, that lowered general fund spending by $250,000. We used 136,000 of it in this technical amendment to address the omission in the ward budgets, and then we are using the 113 left to address the omission of the labor standards co-enforcement contract. 
In order to restore that contract up to the full $200,000, there's still $86,000 left to be appropriated. That's where the second motion that we'll go to next comes in, and that appropriates $86,000 in one-time funds. So in order to, to make that uh, whole back to the $200,000, we'll need to get through motions one and two. Okay, so they sound kind of technical as well. Yeah. All right, I'm not seeing anything more. Um, I think then Mr. Clerk, we're ready to call the roll on uh, motion number one. Council member Reich. All right. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Kano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. That motion carries. We'll move along to motion number two. Um, this is the one that is not as tying up loose ends in nature, but more about changes um, that the mayor wishes to make between August when he released his budget and now. Uh, like Council Member Gordon said, there's it feels like there's overlap in that. So let me just briefly read, uh, go through these seven pieces of it. I will start at the bottom, which is here are the things that are being decreased and why. Um, the first is that some of the way that this money was reallocated was because of the POLAD grant for the EIS, the Early Intervention System for the Police Department. Um, the second source of funding for this money um, is a decrease in the expense in the coordinator's office by $200,000 because that was also covered by the grant accepted uh, from the POLAD Foundation. So with that extra leeway, here are the mayor's five changes. First is an increase in communications department expenses by $25,000 one time to hire a vendor as is best practices to do to review our franchise and public education and government fees that Comcast pays to the city of Minneapolis for the last three years. The second is to do the piece that we were just talking about um, as council member Fletcher stated that would make um, the an additional $113,630 ongoing and have $86,370 one time to continue a labor standards co-enforcement model with our partners. I believe we have three partners in that work. Um, the third is to increase expenses in the health department by $400,000 one time for a regional biochar facility project. And Director Hanlon is on hand if people have questions for him about that, but I know he's fielded some questions already. Um, and let's see, the other piece is the $88,630 one time for contract dollars to prepare the policy and ordinance changes required to implement question number one, the government structure amendment. Um, I believe that the city clerk or other staff would be happy to speak to that. And the other piece is the greater MSP partnership to restore previous ways that we've been a partner in that work and our continued collaboration on greater MSP. And that's a $100,000 one time uh, expense. Any questions or discussion for my, or wait, I guess first I will make that motion. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you. Council Vice President Jenkins seconds the motion. Is there any discussion, comments, or questions from my colleagues on this? Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. I, uh, I don't think there's an item on here that I object to, but I actually do want to raise just from a process standpoint, these are pretty substantive changes for the mayor to bring through the night before budget markup. And I have some concerns, especially because today is literally the first day that the new government structure amendment takes effect. 
Um, I have some concerns about the about process here and about how much power we might be giving away because so much of how government structure is going to be implemented in the next council is really going to depend on the norms that are established. Uh, and if the norm that is established is that the budget chair will bring through whatever amendments the mayor proposes, um, the council is effectively giving away its budget power, which is one of the powers that is still preserved for the council uh, under the new government structure that that is supposed to be clarifying of that, right? And so I honestly, I would have really liked to see the mayor, uh, and I think it would have been quite easy to do, uh, find council authors for these items. Uh, I think it would have been, I mean, I, recognizing that that council member Palmasano's name is on this as the budget chair, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, Council Member Schrader has been a huge advocate for biochar. I, I don't think it would have been hard to reach out to his office and, uh, and partner on that. Uh, several of us have been big advocates on labor standards. I don't think it would have been hard to partner with us and, uh, uh, and, and find council authors for this and to really establish that once the mayor delivers a budget in August, uh, it is then the council's job and the mayor needs to work with the council on substantive items that come through after that. Uh, I think that that's the process we should be establishing. I'm tempted to vote no on this just on that principle. And, and frankly, I think it would be good for this body uh, if we um, uh, were to vote no on this and, and ask the mayor's office to go through the motions of getting council authors for these and bring them through on Monday or on Wednesday. Uh, I don't think that would change the outcome. I actually like these items. I think a lot of them are, are absolutely worthy of support. Um, but but from a process standpoint, this really feels like like the council giving away more of its power than it should be. Uh, and I wanted to to get on record as as being concerned about that. And, and I'm hoping maybe we can have a little more conversation about that as a council as we sort of think about how are we going to enact and establish norms around uh, this new government structure. I still uh, uh, care deeply about this body that I serve on and I want to set it up for success and to be powerful and, and useful in coming years. Thank you. I think that's good feedback. Um, while a number of, you know, you have multiple of these that go to one specific um, decrease to be able to make these other increases, it's pretty obvious that you could piece that out by the $500,000 expense and then the $200,000 expense. Um, I think that like everybody, um, we are all just looking for a little bit of grace and everybody moving as fast as we can. Um, but I think that is a really thoughtful and important point to be careful as to how we implement question number one. I'm going to run through the rest of the people in queue and then um, see if anybody else would like to speak to it. Council Member Bender. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I think I'll be taking us in a bit of a different direction, but I did um, want to take you up on the offer to hear a little bit more about one of the items, which is item four, which is the one-time contract for dollars to prepare the policy ordinance changes related to the government structure change. We did have a brief presentation about this in committee, this being the implementation of the government structure change. There was still quite a lot of unknown um, you know, there was a thing, there was a column that said what we know, which was basically that it is implemented as of today. There was a whole big column full of things we don't know, which was basically everything about how it will be implemented. <laughs> so I do think it would be helpful as we approve this contract to hear for the public record, um, you know, what is known about this contract, what kinds of services will be sought, will that come back to the council for approval? I expect not. Um, what scope will be part of that? Will there be any engagement with the council or the charter commission or the public? Um, any kind of detail about the timeline? Um, typically, once we approve a contract, then we have no other touch points, <clears throat> either with the public or the council. So I think it's worth hearing about it now, um, again, for the public. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Here's my understanding of it, and then I'm going to turn it over to Casey Carl for more. Um, to me, this is, I understand this as pure drafting needs that go over and above the capabilities um, of, or the capacity, not the capabilities of our city attorney's office. You might remember with the plain language charter that was passed in 2013, um, it took about a year and a half to go back and rewrite 
every city ordinance that touched different parts of the charter that then changed. And this is that very direct drafting exercise. It's not something that is gonna have a lot of discretion to it. They'll be taking uh, input and direction from us as a council, as the policymakers, and implementing um, the drafting language for that item. I'm gonna call on Mr. Carl to um, give a little bit more detail. Thanks. Uh, Madam Chair, I think your explanation is uh, sufficient. I'll just say this is monies that would allow for contracts in the future to be done. Uh, obviously, within the existing financial policies, contracts that are at or above a certain amount would need to come back before the council. So this is a one time touch and done. Uh, contracts that would still need further approvals from the city council would need to come through the council's process. Uh, primarily, we're looking at additional uh, legal advice and assistance to provide the drafting of ordinances that implement the government structure. Uh, this is beyond the existing capacity, certainly not the capability, as you noted, of our city attorney's office. Um, this will touch most, if not all, parts of the city's code. Uh, and in order to get that done in a timely basis, that will need some additional legal expertise, especially in terms of municipal law and operations to come forward to supplement the attorneys in the city attorney's office. Uh, this has been an internal conversation between the city coordinator, the city attorney, the city clerk about adding those supplemental resources. Of course, any of those ordinances would need to come through the council process. So council will touch every single one of the ordinances to do implementation as they do today. Um, and I think there are some additional project dollars we're anticipating that might be for um, some project or program coordination out of the city coordinator's office. And I believe uh, our interim coordinator, Heather Johnston, may be on the call as well and can speak further to this. Um, she was carrying this item forward on behalf of the enterprise uh, in terms of just securing the monies that would pay for project coordination, uh, legal drafting and writing of ordinances and things of that matter. Um, so again, within the existing financial policies and certainly the governance structure, uh, those contracts that would be at or above a certain threshold would need to come back to council for authorization and approval. Every ordinance that uh, would have to be uh, completed or enacted in terms of implementing would also have to come back through the council. So I would anticipate as with the plain language charter implementation that you referenced, which was a good example, there will be multiples of contact points with council and with council committees, whatever that structure is in the next term. But uh, again, I would defer to Ms. Johnston for, for more specific details. Um, that's my knowledge of this uh, proposal. Council Member Bender, did you want me to call on Coordinator Johnston for more? Um, yes, I think that would be helpful. And and so just from what the clerk just stated, my understanding is that this would be a contract for legal services specifically. Does that sound Drafting correct? Drafting services, I believe, but I'm going to... I'll Madam Chair, to the Council the, President's point, I would ahead. say what I said was there are legal drafting services that are required. There also could be program or project management services. Um, those are the two major scopes of work that I had identified. Ms. Johnston, I see, has activated her camera. There may be others, but those are certainly two of the major pieces that we have talked about internally are legal drafting uh, functions and then program or project coordinated work. Okay, Ms. Johnston. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, and then I think it'd be helpful to hear anything that folks may be able to say for the public related to the timeline. Ms. Johnston. Um, Madam Chair, Councilman President Bender. Um, yes, I think uh, the City Clerk Carl has um, correctly described. I think the reason it's going to the coordinator's office is we're not exactly sure how that breaks out in terms of administration versus drafting. Obviously, the city attorney's office will be the ones who will be um, hiring um, hiring the, the city attorney sort of supplemental um, resources in terms of doing staffing. And so we'll have to work that out as we learn more. Um, in terms of timing, I, I think the uh, the mayor's direction is to, to try and move this forward as quickly as possible. As you know, he is working with um, governance. He has called together an external group um, that is working and expects to have some recommendations um, in January related to governance structure. And so he will be taking the, the options that are presented from them and will be obviously talking with the council as well and um, having those conversations in the first quarter. So. 
Yeah, it may seem obvious that the mayor would be talking to the council, but it, it may not be. <laughs> um, is Are those meetings publicly facing from the work groups and commissions or are those like private meetings that would then be presented publicly if there is a decision point? Um, Madam Chair, Council President Bender, um, there are non-elected officials involved in those um, meetings and so they are not um, public meetings. Uh, the Obviously any results from that working group will be public um, when they make their recommendations. Okay, thank you and thank you for indulging in this. Um, you know, we've had a number of recent examples where, of contracts that have come to the council one time with a very high level kind of description and then the council never has any, you know, just doesn't have control over what happens with the money from there, from who is hired, what the detailed scope of services is. This is such an important question, how people are interacting with their government, who is making decisions and how, how much public transparency is there or not. Does the city council know what's going on or not? Um, and so I really do appreciate taking a little bit of time to go through um, all of the work that is ahead to develop a plan for implementing question one. Of course, there was so much dialogue around, is there a plan or not for various things? We know, of course, that for question one, the plan um, to implement this massive change in our government structure is now just starting with the potential hiring of a consultant to manage that process. So um, it will be really important for people to be able to try to track what's happening, um, how the decisions are being implemented before there is a plan in place, before the ordinances are updated, before the commission is making its recommendations in this interim period where we have had a significant shift in how decisions will be made at the city. Um, so appreciate the time and, you know, I want this to go well. I don't doubt the need for more resources. Um, It'll just be important for people to understand that once the city council approves this money, we have no control over what happens with it. Council member Gordon. Yeah, obviously there's a lot more substance than here than technical changes. I just want to be clear. Um, we haven't already approved number two. So we vote this down. There actually won't be the 113,086. 86,000 or so dollars going to labor standards that we just approved. Why is that here twice? I'm going to call on Director Kruver for that one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. Thank you, Council Member Gordon. So in this amendment, we are adding that $86,000. The, the numbers are both there to try and convey that it's a two-parter that we need to get to that $200,000, but we want each amendment to balance. And so in the first technical amendment, we lowered spending by $250,000. And then we added spending to the clerk's office, and then we added whatever was remaining, that 113, to the co-enforcement. And that's all we could do in that first amendment to make sure it was balanced. This amendment frees okay. up. Yeah, that's right. This amendment frees up that remaining one time. So that's why we put it in there. We tried to be really clear that the total was going to be 200,000. Sounds like it was more confusing. So I think that's good feedback, but ultimately this is just appropriating that $86,000 in one time. So if this fails, at least we know they got the 113, um, 630. So that would be good. Um, I, I also, um, I can see that the mayor just, just figured out from the POLAD grant, he had an extra $700,000. So he's trying to pick up some pieces probably that didn't get covered earlier. The 25,000 for analyzing Comcast was probably a staff recommendation. I'm sure the biochar one came through too. The both of those seem like reasonable um, uh, things. I think that the biochar is leveraging a lot and gives us a great opportunity. I'm very supportive of that. Less so of uh, number four. I actually think that we should amend that and it should go to the city council um, and then we could maintain some control over it. Clearly what's going to happen with this uh, charter change is um, there's going to be a power play even to amplify what's going on and then and, and the council will be cut out of it further as we clearly have been cut out of the commission and if we've been cut out of this um, amendment even coming down. So um, uh, if, 
it would be great to divide these. Um, if we divided them, I would like to move to make sure that number four increases the expenses in the city council uh, budget by that amount so that they can have somebody being their advocate and do the, and manage those contracts and approve it later. I think that would be a great gesture we could make with the incoming council. Um, I also um, have big concerns about um, the 100,000 going to greater MSP partnership I think that we could probably think of some more beneficial um, places for that funding where we'd actually see results for the city of Minneapolis. I think what we've seen over the years with that partnership is that we end up making a big contribution so that the region, the suburbs, others can attract big employers that don't necessarily locate in our city. Um, and it hasn't really brought and yielded benefits and they've never really um, come before us and proven um, that they're they're delivering on that in my humble opinion. Um, I also in number six, um, I have big concerns about this 500,000 staying in the police department for the early warning system that we were promised they would deliver to us in 2007. And again, repeatedly um, term after term after term and they failed to do so. Um, I have prepared a motion to move that into civil rights um, last budget. Um, it was unsuccessful. I would like to bring another one forward um, too. And I would like some clarity on that um, in terms of um, that grant dollars. Um, once we get the grant dollars in the city budget, um, we have the discretion of, of implementing those in, in a way that's to our liking. So we could potentially move that. Um, $500,000 to the coordinator's office, or if we had a new public safety department there, or maybe to help, I mean, to implement that early warning system or because uh, HR would certainly be a good fit for it as well. So maybe I could get an answer on the question there about um, do, could we um, move the $500,000 in one-time EIS expenses to a different department? Okay, Council Member Gordon, I'm going to suggest um, from all of your comments, I'm going to suggest two things um, and to do it in this order. First, um, I think that what you're saying about the uh, city coordinator one time contract dollars, the 88 plus thousand, um, if you want that to be more in the council's purview, I don't see you needing to break something out of this for that purpose. Rather, I think you could simply amend it to say in the city council office or to the city clerk um, and we could invite that change to happen if you would like and then secondly I'm going to ask I think the budget director to talk a little bit more about those grant dollars in part six um, because that goes to how we accepted a grant in a council action but first is that going to satisfy your concern would be to in part four put it to the city council so that a future city council um, specifically allocates it to that drafting exercise. Well yeah for that item I think I was pretty clear it probably did more than allude to my desire to move it to the council but um, I would um, that's something I would like to, to um, have considered. Uh, obviously I'd like to hear about um, the 500,000 um, and I know that I lost on that vote earlier when we accepted it and moved it to that department, but that was us doing it. So we could move it to another department. Um, Director Kruver, could you help us? Um, could you help to speak about the flexibility of moving the funds for the EIS around to different departments? Yes, thank you, Chair Palmasano, and thank you, Councilmember Gordon. So. Today's work will be moving the general fund appropriation that was going to the police department for this purpose out to other departments, as you can see in items like one through five. So there won't be any more general funds appropriated to the EIS system to move. So then we're getting into something that's not quite my area of expertise, but I'll give my best answer right now. The funds that would be supporting the EIS are, as, as you stated, the grant funds that we've received. So those were deposited into our grant funds when it came through council a couple months ago. In order to move that, I think that we would need to 
probably do some kind of change an amendment to the grant fund. But before we do that, I would think the grant contract would need to be adjusted by the between the departments involved and the grantor. Um, and like I said, grant administration is not my strong suit, but that's my understanding of the sort of order of events that would need to happen. Well, maybe you could send me a copy of that grant um, after the meeting or somebody could so that I could see that we've signed something that says it's committed to one department or another. That would be a little bit surprising for me, but it's possible that they actually wanted to do that. And wouldn't it be interesting? We have $500,000 in the budget right now. We could spend on EIS and we could freely move to another department. We could return the grant money and say, thank you very much, Pearl Ads. Um, we appreciate you trying to uh, influence us, but we can handle this on our own and move that, um, which would be great. I still think we should probably divide this issue, but if you'd entertain a motion to amend number four to say increase expenses to the city council by 88,631 time for contract dollars to prepare the policy and ordinance changes required to implement the government structure change. Um, if I got a second on that, that would be fine. I don't have it written and I'm sorry about that. Would you like me to write it? I'm, I'm sorry. Um Councilmember Gordon, you could either repeat that or what I was going to suggest that I was just writing here is a friendly amendment, um, amending the item four um, to strike the city coordinator and replace it with city council, leaving the rest of that part as stated. Uh, that's, that, what I think. that's great. Is that what, okay. So yes, I, um, I, I will accept through this conversation a friendly amendment to amend item four um, and strike the city coordinator and replace it with city council. I won't show you my messy handwriting here, um, but I'm gonna ask the clerk, um, or can we just talk through this change? It literally replaces city coordinator in part four with city council. Yes, Madam Chair, that's that's understood. Perfect. Um, so now um, the the motion includes that piece of part four. Um, I hear your comments, Councilmember Gordon. Is there anything else that you want to do right now on this item before I go to the next people in queue? No, I'd like to be um, instructed later if uh, we can vote. Um, if we can divide this somehow. So if I wanted to say, for example, to vote no on number five, um, I could do so, or if it's a whole package. But I believe that you could, just like we do in other things, vote right. no on a part of this amendment. Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I went into queue to just give my support for number three, but first I just kind of want to talk about the points that Council Member Fletcher and also Council Member Gordon brought up. I think it's pretty critical. Uh, points that I want to make sure aren't getting lost. Um, like I appreciate the council member Fletcher bringing up that this is, you know, the council giving up its power, but I, I want to make the point that it's much, much more than that. The city voted to consolidate a large amount of power into one person without a plan. And that's going to be something that I, I think we're going to have to really be careful about. And this is one part, um, like having the kind of the transparency and the accountability is a check on government. These are democratic reforms that people before us really fought to be included to make sure that the public understands what's going on and can influence that. Uh, and I think Councilmember Fletcher rightly brings up, you know, some of the issues that that could happen. And so, I, while these are all really good things that will be, you know, I think we'll vote all in favor of, um, it does set a precedent that I think it's important to note that, you know, we want to make sure that there is an open, transparent process that there is accountability to the public that elects us in the office. Um, on number three, just want to give a little bit of background. I, I have been a huge supporter of this for a long time. And just to give uh, my colleagues a better idea, this is uh, the city's part of a, a hope, what is hopefully a matching grant. We've been working with uh, Bloomberg Phil uh, Philanthropies for, for years now. Um, and we are actually one of 10 cities in the world that is really working on biochar at the scale that other, uh, that is, 
you know, put us really at the um, head of what's going on globally um, around regenerative agriculture and re reducing our carbon. Um, it's really critical. The city doesn't have anything like this. And in fact, most cities in the world do not have anything like this. So I'm, I'm really excited about where we are. I'll be very highly supporting number three. Um, Want to thank the the team that we like. We're only um, in this global ranking because of the amazing staff that's really been built into a huge team. Um, so I'm happy to support it and uh, hope my colleagues do as well. Thank you, Council Member Schrader. Um, I also have a biochar pilot in my ward um, that's been going on for a few years now, but I'm going to call on Director Patrick Hanlon um, if he is available and on the call just to share a couple of details because you touched on some of them, but I'd like him to maybe just say a little bit more about where we're at and why this money uh, would be really useful now. Welcome, Director. Sure, thank you. My name is Patrick Hanlon. I'm the Director of Environmental Programs. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, Council members. Um, yeah, so biochar is a soil amendment uh, that we've been running, uh, we've been doing programs here in Minneapolis, including in your ward, Councilmember Palmasano, and, and many of the other wards out there, uh, including especially focused in environmental justice areas. We've do, done projects at Little Earth, we've done urban farms, urban gardens, uh, have been doing roadway projects with Hennepin County recently, I have done park board projects with tree planting. It's a soil amendment that improves the soil health of our urban soils here in Minneapolis. Um, it's uh, we try, like I said, we try to focus on environmental justice. So focus. We're currently working with Environmental Initiative. If we uh, we've been purchasing biochar since 2013, if we're able to get this funding to start producing biochar with the uh, leveraging of the Bloomberg dollars, like Councilmember Schrader mentioned, we'll get uh, it'll be leveraging $400,000 there, and then another $100,000 in the Sustainability Directors Network. Um, and the project, I should also mention that the project will be revenue neutral. So we'll be able to uh, have full cost recovery on the program uh, going forward. So the project will pay for itself once, it, once it's set up. Um, and then the byproduct of all this is that it sequesters carbon for between one and 2000 years. And it will be the first carbon sequestration project in Minneapolis. And this will be a nationally leading project uh, across, across the country in terms of uh, addressing climate change. And if there's any other questions uh, that I may have missed, uh, I'd be open to, to take those questions on the on the project. Sure, um, I, there are other people in queue, but I don't know for which topic. So I will just ask if anybody has another question for Director Hanlon on the biochar topic specifically. Did you wanna go ahead and, and let me know? I'm not seeing any at this time. Thank you, Director, uh, Thank for you. that. Mm-hmm. Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. Let's see. Um, I wondered if we could get more information about item five, which is the $100,000 increase for the Greater MSP Partnership. Sure. Um, Director Kruver um, uh, or um, Coordinator Johnston, I think would probably be most appropriate for that. I think I'll, what do you think, Director Kruver? <laughs> sure, Chair Palmasano, I can start off with a, a high level description while um, Coordinator Johnson has more detail on that. The Coordinator's Office operates the part, uh, Partnerships Program, but um, <clears throat> just a high level description. This is membership in Greater MSP, which is a group that does economic development activities for cities all around um, the Twin Cities area. Um, so that's the high level description. I think that uh, program details um, either, or I know that um, Director Brennan might have some information too, if, uh, count, if um, Coordinator Johnston is unavailable. And it, it might be helpful to have a reminder of what's the total amount of city contribution to greater MSP and then what would this $100,000 add to what we'd be expected, you know, activities or capacity, yes. or what would it be for? Council President Bender, I can answer that one and thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, so this was part of our partnerships budget in 2020. In 2021, the partnerships budget was cut 
uh, in an ongoing way to manage the reductions that were made in that year's budget. There was one-time dollars. There were one-time dollars added to the coordinator's office um, that were not added in the original budget of 20 for 2022. So the only funding that we have that goes to Greater MSP comes through this partnerships budget in the coordinators department. So this would just essentially be our membership payment into Greater MSP, and it is the only uh, contribution that we make in all of our city funds to Greater MSP. It's also my understand me, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Director, um, that we have pulled back on this payment these past couple of years. Um, when we redid the 2020 budget, did we not cut this? Yes, and it's been um, funded $125,000, I believe, is the membership amount. Um, so savings have been used by the coordinator's office to maintain that and in one time funding has been added. So the ongoing funds were cut uh, in the 2021 budget as a cost saving measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll invite Director Brennan to add a couple other comments. Welcome, Director. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members. I can just add a couple of additional points here. One is that Greater MSP has um, has stepped forward and is convening a group of local government agencies uh, in the metropolitan area. So all of the counties and the cities um, to, um, <clears throat> to help make sure that we are uh, seeking and um, applying for all of the federal funds that are available for economic recovery and investment in um, key industries, including uh, bio industries. And so they're, um, they're being responsive to the, the moment. And um, I think <clears throat> playing a really important role in, um, uh, in you know, making our region more competitive for um, potentially additional federal funds. And they have taken the lead in submitting a funding requests to the Economic Development Authority um, federal agency. So they, they are, um, I, I would say, you know, even the city has historically supported this economic development partnership. Um, this is a, a new role that they are, are playing and I think is um, important in this moment. Thank you. That's helpful. I appreciate the extra context and background. Um, I did also just want to quickly clarify, and then I'm done. I think on these, um, you know, Councilmember Gordon made a few comments on item six that I thought might be a bit confusing for folks who may be following along. Um, so I just wanted to clarify some of the history of this. So the city has funded an, an early intervention system many times in the past. Um, in the police department, it has never been implemented. Um, this council has voted a few times on various versions of this. Uh, when the grant came through committee a couple of months ago, there was a motion to move it out of the police department and into finance or IT in order to try to provide some more, um, you know, oversight and some maybe assurance that it would actually get done this time. That vote failed. Um, I voted for it um, and would certainly support that move and have many times, but um, it failed in committee. So this, um, you know, just to kind of read it and clarify, this motion today would decrease that funding because it has been, that was in the mayor's original proposed budget for MPD to add $500,000 to MPD specifically to do this early intervention system. Um, again, adding money um, to the department that has been changed and covered by the grant. So this would cut the money from the police department and use it to fund the other additional items that are in this motion. Um, certainly like I think you summarized and the finance director or budget director summarized, you know, if there was interest in shifting the the um, activity from MPD to a different department that could come as an amendment. But again, we had that vote a couple of months ago and it failed. Thanks. Thank you. And I did just want to note for people in the public, Council Member Gordon had put something that was like the greater MSP um, news page, but to the question at hand of who some of the partners are in greater MSP, um, it looks to be most of the counties. Hennepin County plays a role, obviously Dakota County, um, Scott County, um, both mayors of St. Paul and Minneapolis are on this board. Um, 
all, a number of smaller cities, um, nearby suburbs and further away suburbs. Um, and I know I'm just, I put the link in the chat, but I'm just listing a couple of the municipalities that are involved, Mayo Clinic, um, some of the larger um, like Fortune 100 kinds of companies are also on this list. But the second link would help to just share a little bit more about who all the people are at the table um, for greater MSP. Councilmember Fletcher, you are next. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. I uh, wanted to, um, I, I partially got in queue to ask the same question that, that Council President Bender did about, uh, uh, about Greater MSP, and I appreciate getting a little more uh, context on that. I, I just want to know from my colleagues, so first of all, I, I, I don't think that I'm hearing energy around sort of changing course on this, this uh, in this budget cycle. Uh, so I do just want to sort of encourage for the future for this to not become the norm uh, for for the mayor to bring forward a, a large substantive package like this um, without more collaboration with with the council. Um, but uh, one thing that I am interested in that I've I've talked to many of you about is is I, I think item two is still inadequate. I think particularly because the civil rights department is um underfunded or is is understaffed right now and so there's there's uh potentially not as many resources as we even attempted to allocate in the budget uh for labor standards enforcement i think increasing the co-enforcement budget uh beyond what we had last year would be a good thing um i i think i'm i was interested in potentially uh moving uh the greater MSP dollars to that bucket. I think I'm going to hold off on that for today because I haven't had a chance to talk to people about it. But I'll just flag that given the concerns that the budget director has raised about uh, general fund sources or you know ab about uh, spending out of the general fund that we are seeking a source for this. And I would say that I'll probably uh, vote this through today, but, but flag that this may be a source that we come back for Monday or Wednesday um, because I'm not sure that our membership in Greater MSP feels as important to me as uh, making sure that there's adequate labor enforcement resources to protect uh, vulnerable workers in our community. And so I, I, that might be a, a trade that I'll propose next week. I'd be interested in feedback uh, from my colleagues about that either in this meeting or offline. And uh, let's continue that discussion. But uh, I think that's that seems to be where uh, uh, where we're heading in terms of this vote is that we'll probably support these items, but I, but with with some amount of caution about uh, process and about establishing norms for the future, uh, and uh, appreciate the conversation on that. And then let's uh, sort of keep keep this one flagged as something that we we may want to look to if we don't find a better source. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Fletcher. A couple of comments that I want to make on this um, is that first, historically. The precedent is that the mayor works with the budget chair to do exactly these kinds of things. Um, I saw that happen before my time with Mayor Ryback. That always happened with Mayor Hodges. And Mayor Fry has done the same thing in previous years, and he's doing it again here. That said, I really do hear your feedback strongly that as we move to this more legislative council, executive mayor, clearer lines of authority, um, it would be really good to make this change and to do so in a structural way uh, that ties us into working together more. Um, I also wanted just to bring to your attention um, it, one of the reasons that the mayor wishes, you know, this question, the part two and part five is part five, the Greater MSP Partnership. It's been one time funding as long as I can remember. And part of that is does display um, that it is something that we have been able to decrease or to cut during hard times. Um, so, you know, that additional co-enforcement would still be a one time expense. Um, I also want to appreciate that I think that the part two piece of having this roughly $114,000 is ongoing is an improvement um, and more than what some of the people working on the outside to to talk to us about 
the need for this um, might have understood. There was some great confusion shortly, uh, late October, early November around around this, around why it went away and if it was coming back and everything. And this is this is a product of those conversations from back in October. Um, Councilmember Cano, you are next in queue. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I, I do have a question about the, the greater MSP item, and um, it's more about um, sort of what does the city get out of it and who, um, who from the city represents our voice and our priorities at that table, as well as um, how that work translates to clear and tangible and um, measurable racial equity outcomes in Minneapolis, particularly now in the time when um, there's many of us who are working really hard to um, rebuild Minneapolis um, by centering the role of arts and culture, the creative economy and uh, racial justice without displacing residents and um, promoting gentrification. So um, maybe Director Brennan can help and 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 I do have a, a sort of a membership question and I don't know if that's more for Amelia or somebody else, but um, I'm not opposed to these um, pay to play models where if the city of Minneapolis ponies up a certain amount of money, then that means we get to direct the values, the outcomes and the initiatives of certain coalitions and tables. Um, but I think it is important that we're all very clear and explicit in what we're getting out of it and, and who's at that table working for Minneapolis voters and taxpayers to get that result. Uh, because just because we send $100,000 to greater MSP, it, it doesn't mean that the results just happen to um, magically appear. You really do have to drive those results and make sure that they are aligning with um, the rest of the body of work that the city of Minneapolis carries. And so I just, you know, did some quick quick math here. And if there are 12 different cities or jurisdictions or counties paying in $100,000 each uh, per year, that's a revenue of roughly $1.2 million. And so it is a sizable amount if you start to think about um, the Twin Cities region and how different members play um, pay a membership into that. So, so I'm curious if somebody could explain, you know, is, th is this an annual membership every year? And if yes, uh, who, how many other people are paying a membership? Are we talking about 50 different partners paying $100,000 or just like three or four different members paying $100,000? And then specifically, how is our money into this partnership um, explicitly advancing racial equity and racial justice within the city of Minneapolis. Thank you, council member. Um, I will just offer that Greater MSP is a nonprofit. So similarly to other kinds of initiatives that are regional, um, my very uh, shallow understanding of it is that it is, it is about getting people to the table. And I would anticipate that surely, you know, Target Corporation pays a different fee than the uh, Elko, New Market, uh, Bell Plain uh, members. And I'm not sure what that's based off of or what that's suggested. And I will ask um, Director Brennan again, if she has any additional input. Um, otherwise, the coordinator's office and specifically Fatima Moore might be able to offer some more or we could get some more after this um, after this after today. Director Brennan. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilmember Cano. Um, one of the things that Greater MSP is doing, like I said is it earlier, is that they are convening all of the regional public partners. So all of the cities and, and counties and in, in the metro metropolitan area. And I mentioned that they have submitted uh, an application to the um, as part of the uh, Build Back Better Regional Challenge Grant proposal. And this is for um, <clears throat> what they're calling a bold north bio innovation cluster. 
um, phase one concept. There's a proposal that they've drafted. It's pretty um, detailed and comprehensive, so I would be happy to um, get that from them and send that out to all of you so you can see as an example um, <clears throat> one of the things that they are doing on behalf of um, our region and um, one of the key components of this proposal is um, employment and training, um, uh, you know, focus and, um, and particularly targeting um, uh, low income communities of color and making sure that there is very, very strong um, training and, um, and workforce development component of this work. So I, again, I would be happy to send out um, to get a copy of the proposal and to send that to all of you so you can see that as an example of some of the work that they are leading for our region right now. Thank you. I, Go ahead, Council Member Connell. Yes, thank you, Director Brennan, for that information. I think that absolutely we should get a copy of that proposal or, or grant submittal to better understand how it um, translates to the granular work of our commercial corridors, our cultural corridors across um, the city. Um, and again, I'm not opposed to a, a pay to play model. I just think that in this moment in time when there are literally dozens and dozens of convening um, of tables that are convening on Lake Street. I think we have five, <laughs> five different tables that convene with like literally the same people. <laughs> it's the same people reconfigured in different ways. Um, I really worry about sort of the, the diluting um, sort of duplicating efforts and, you know, are we getting the most for our money um, and and sort of what what specifics are you know our immigrant entrepreneurs getting from from these resources our BIPOC um, business owners um, you know what, what is that translatability work how, how does that happen what does that look like uh, how does that feel and and can we have a greater connections between the two um, because there are so many different people I think that are trying to advance the same conversation uh, but oftentimes they're not really talking to each other or connecting so if, if we are going to invest in this um, in a continued way, um, how, how is this work being uh, connected, actively, proactively connected to um, boots on the ground to ensure that um, it's not a lot of um, grass tops leaders making decisions for, on the backs of uh, people of color and immigrant community members in, in our neighborhoods. Um, so it would be great to, to really better understand what is that racial equity impact? Um, how much money are we talking about? What are the timelines? What are the numbers? How many new jobs have been created? Um, what doors are being opened to undocumented workers? You know, these kinds of specifics would be really helpful. And, um, and I, I work with some members on greater MSP. I know, you know, some of them, I've been to some of their events, so it's not that they're a foreign entity to me, uh, but it, it, it is really about um, strategically how efficient and effective is this investment. Um, and it's not to be malicious, but it is really to, to call the question about um, are we getting, uh, you know, what we need out of this money and, and what else do we need to introduce into this conversation to make sure that we are. Um, so would appreciate that and um, not, not really sure what, what it means for this vote today. I, I could go either way on this um, uh, in terms of number five. Thank you. Sure. Um, I did ask Fatima, our intergovernmental relations um, director, if she wanted to have any more, but she did say she'll work with Director Brennan to offer additional information um, for those interested. Um, are there, is there anybody else in queue to speak to this item for now? I'm not seeing any. Um, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll on this item. Council Member Reich. Aye. Gordon. I know on number five. Cunningham. Council member Cunningham. Ellis, I. Oh, Cunningham, I. Yes. 
Thank you. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes except part five, which has 11 ayes and one nay. Thank you. That motion carries, um, and I will say it's with the friendly amendment in part four uh, to instead direct that money to the city council instead of to the city coordinator as we further our efforts in implementing uh, charter amendment question one. Moving on uh, to the third amendment, uh, I'm going to ask Director Kruver to help give us more information about this one. This is also a mayoral amendment. And in brief, this is about bringing our 911 uh, operators out of the basement of City Hall, um, where they have been for decades, is my understanding. So, Director Kruver, um, I'm going to hand this one over to you. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. So, this is an amendment to increase funding for an existing capital project referred to often as the City Hall Restack Project. This would increase funding by $1.7 million. And the to give a little bit of background, there was a standalone capital project that was included in deliberations on the capital budget this year to fund uh, uh, improvements in the 911 center. The CLIC committee, the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee approved that project. The mayor's budget did not include it because at the time we did not think that we had the funding available to fund it. The original proposal was somewhere close to $6 million. Since we've worked with our uh, director of property services, Barbara O'Brien, to figure out is there something else we can do taking advantage of the timing of the City Hall Restack project where improvements are being made up and down City Hall. Um, many of you I'm sure have seen the construction going on in the halls when you've been in. So there is some savings that can be captured by doing this work at the same time that MBC and the city is doing overall improvements to City Hall. So with some retooling and rescoping by our partners and property services, we were able to lower the cost of this. And then the second piece is that uh, with the later sale of our bond than we typically do during the budget cycle, we were able to confirm that additional resources can be made available to cover this cost within our capital um, improvement plan. So this is essentially improving the area that 911 is in and moving them up a floor. So they will be in the basement and first floor or in ground floor rather than the basement and sub-basement. So these are improvements that I know our partners and 911 have been seeking for several years and um, we were able to accommodate it in our budget due to sort of the better information about our bond sale and the proceeds that will be able to be available. So uh, happy to stand for any questions on this uh, amendment. Thank you for describing that much better than I could. <laughs> I know that others have been more deeply involved on this project than I, um, especially the people who had been working on some of the building projects like our new public service building. And I thank my colleagues for that work. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is uh, more just a, a question on logistics here. I know that uh, you mentioned ground floor and basement, ground floor as well. Just wondering uh, kind of any points around security, if we think, for instance, about the civil unrest and how important continuity of 911 was, and also how City Hall was uh, potentially a focal point of protests and uh, perhaps people trying to get into the building depending on how the situation could have escalated right now one of the advantages is of the current basement is having a little more con security control over that from an operational standpoint so i guess i'm wondering uh, if you could talk through any kind of considerations around that uh, i also understand since it's security related it may not be appropriate to have that conversation out in the open like this, so I'm happy to have that uh, conversation offline as well. But I did at least want to mention that since uh, this item is coming before us. 
Thank you. I'm guessing that Barbara O'Brien might be the most appropriate person to have that conversation and she might indeed want to have that conversation offline with you. Director Kruver, would you point this, these questions anywhere else? I would, I would just add that the, these plans have been made in coordination with 911 and our, our partners in property services. So I would encourage an online or an offline conversation with them if you have any concerns, but I know that they've been working together on this plan. So I think that their concerns are addressed. Okay, is that sufficient for you for now? Council Member Johnson and we can follow up offline. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I might just uh, procedurally abstain on this one until I get my questions answered offline. Thank you. Sure. Council Member Gord, uh, Goodman. Thank you, Madam Chair. As the person who drew the short stick and serves on the Building Commission and also the main lead on the new building, I'll tell you it is really important for us to get this done this year. Um, although it might feel like 911 is safe and secure, it is the leading um, problem amongst our employees. The fact that they are in the basement and there are all sorts of environmental and water and air quality issues in that space. And for too long, we have treated these employees as though they are so essential that they have to be in this basement. And um, I did look at whether or not we could put the 911 function in the new city office building. That would be something to ask. We have an open floor. But it turns out that moving all of that equipment across the street is what makes the cost be $6 million. And moving the equipment up one floor just basically allows them to, you know, kind of create these cones that they move the wires up. And so they really have to be kind of above where they are in order to get them out of the basement. We generally probably wouldn't choose to put 911 in a public place, but to be fair, open windows, access to outside, better air quality are critical for these employees who are doing, I think what we would all agree, is an extremely stressful job. I will remind everyone that the city shares this building, not our new public service center, but the city hall building itself with the county, and that we share in the expenses in a 60-40 split, but all capital expenses that serve just the needs of the city are 100% our responsibility. So I am happy that we've been able to find some funding in order to make this happen. I'll throw in my editorial comment that I don't think we need to have our own 911 system and we probably should be merged with the county. But that said, we should move forward with this because we it's very hard to keep employees in 911 as it is. And I know many of you, most of you have done more work on 911 than me. Uh, but after serving on the Building Commission board for eight, no, two non-consecutive terms for eight years, this has been something under discussion all of those years. And if we want to have our employees treated better, that's one of many reasons to make this move. Thank you. And thank you for being part of the Building Commission. Um, that is a pretty thankless job almost all of the time. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, I know the, uh, first of all, I'm very supportive of this. I, I, the workers have wanted this for a long time and I think uh, Council Member Goodman's points are absolutely right about uh, access to light. And uh, I, I think we, we do have an obligation to those workers. So I'm supportive of the investment. I, I do just wanna make sure I understand what the source is I know when we're making a capital project investment, we're talking about probably increasing what we go to the bond market for. Uh, so that'll have some long term debt service implications. Um, probably fairly minimal in the grand scheme of things in a city budget to do 1.7 million in in uh, bonding. But I just want to make sure we understand what 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 the implications are of this in terms of our, our overall obligations. Director Kruver. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Palmasano, and for the question, Council Member Fletcher. So this will have no impact on our levy this year or our levy um, forecast into the next five years, which we usually do. The combination of things have led to us being able to identify these resources. One is that when we have old bonds that we have collected money to repay, but we've repaid them and they're, they are the issuances are put to sleep, and we truly have money left over that can be used flexibly. So after a thorough analysis of 
our uh, debt service payments, existing bonds, we were able to free up some cash in that way. Then the second part is just having more favorable conditions in our bond sale so that we have uh, flexible money to be able to spend on this than we had anticipated. It's really to do with the timing of that bond sale and the details being available after the mayor's budget came out. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or discussion on item number three? I'm not seeing any. I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on item number three. Council Member Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Councilmember Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. That item carries. Um, we're going to move on to motion number four. Um, it's authored by Council Member Johnson. This is pursuant to um, a memo that I sent, I think it was mid-October, um, about reminding us all uh, of the ordinance that we created actually in the very beginning of this term, which was about how we would um, consider future salary adjustments for the council and mayor's salaries. Um, Mr. Carl is here and prepared to speak to any details. I will first ask Council Member Johnson to queue up motion number four. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move motion number four. And would you like me to read the whole thing or just the now therefore be recalled? You could summarize it in your own words. I think that would be fine. Certainly. Well, this is uh, bringing forward, and we're bringing forward at this time too. Councilmember Gordon and I worked on an ordinance uh, to increase transparency by having this come forward through our budget process. And so there's time for the public uh, to see and be able to react or speak to this as well. Uh, and so there's advance notice. Um, and in this, really, we're not. Uh, increasing the salary uh, by a, a fixed amount like last time, uh, last term, because of that adjustment and given the economic circumstances, this does include a cost of living adjustment uh, in there for both the mayor and the council. And then it directs city staff to undertake a comprehensive uh, analysis that could be used next time at the end of next term for consideration. And I will stand for any questions. Well, here, wait. First, um, Councilmember Johnson has made this motion. Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Gordon, also an author of our new protocol, thank you, um, has seconded that motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on item number four. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. That motion carries. Um, colleagues, I do want to mention that we are approaching the noon hour. I don't think there's any way we will get done with our all of these amendments before um, hunger gets the best of us here. And so I am going to suggest that we we go for another 20 minutes roughly and see how many more of these we get through and then we'll take a 30 minute recess for lunch. If you have other 
um, needs or ideas or need longer for that lunch period, I don't anticipate it will be a real long afternoon, um, but that is my plan. So um, please give me feedback accordingly, accordingly in all the ways that you do. Um, next is motion number five. Um, I will, this is an authored amendment by Council Members Bender, Ellison, and Gordon. Um, I will recognize Council President Bender to introduce this amendment. Thanks, Madam Chair. This amendment um, is one way to implement our right to council ordinance that was unanimously adopted by the City Council and either signed or returned um, by the mayor um, earlier this year. And um, we have identified some one-time funding sources for the legal services needed to help um, folks who are facing eviction in our court system, but there is currently no ongoing funding in any budget um, for, uh, for this use. So given the unanimous commitment that we have made to integrate right to counsel as one of our housing stability strategies as a city, it's a really important piece of the puzzle in making sure people are safely and stably housed. Um, this is one step toward providing that ongoing um, funding that will be needed to make sure that this continues into the future. Um, this is, you know, a fraction of the total cost, but we also are developing strong partnerships with Hennepin County, which is increasing funding for this use. And I think there is increased um, interest in this from community partners as well. So over time, as this becomes more integrated into our housing systems in the state of Minnesota, in Hennepin County, in our city, um, you know, I think there'll be more and more support um, so we thought this was a good start and the funding source is our affordable housing trust fund. Luckily, because our inclusionary zoning policy is so successful, we've uh, raised $3 million worth of funding that can be used to provide um, for the uh, for the uses in the affordable housing trust fund. Um, this um, change shouldn't impact our ability to preserve or build affordable housing. In fact, we have more money from that um, uh, successful ordinance um, to invest. Thank you. Thank you. So Council Member Bender moves this motion, which is taking $250,000 out of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and availing it for legal services uh, for renters. And would Council Members Ellison or Gordon like to second this amendment? Council Member Ellison, I'll, I'll go ahead and second this amendment. Thank you. Council Member Ellison seconds this amendment. Is there any discussion? I see Council Member Ellison in queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't want to add too much. Just to <clears throat> just to say that this is um, for folks who are at home. This isn't the as Council President said. This doesn't represent the total that we'll be putting towards this effort, but this represents a. Uh, 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 an amount in ongoing sources. And I think that in the future, you know, we're going to need this service. The city of Minneapolis is going to need, renters in Minneapolis are going to are going to need legal representation. Um, I think it's a good way for us to be able to be proactive about heading off some of the issues that we're facing in our city, um, you know, rising costs, homelessness. And, you know, with, um, with uh, you know, right to counsel, I think, uh, you know, it's proven that not only um, uh, do renters need legal representation when they're in when they're uh, when they're facing eviction, but also that even when the issue is non payment of rent um, that uh, that the outcomes for renters with legal representation tend to be better uh, that they avoid ending up out on the street. Uh, and so just want to co sign this and can't say it any better than uh, Council President Bender, um, but hope that all my colleagues support this and um, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other is there any other discussion from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. 
Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. That motion carries. Moving along to motion number six, amendment number six is brought by Council Member Gordon. I'll recognize Council Member Gordon to introduce this amendment. Thank you very much, Chair Palmasano. Uh, this is a, an amendment regarding funding to neighborhood organizations. It's amending the 2022 mayor's recommended budget in the neighborhood and community relations special revenue fund by increasing expenditures by $420,000, increasing transfers from um, another fund, 01 SNR, by $334,000 and in revenue into the neighborhood and community relations special revenue fund by the same amount and further using $86,000 in unused but previously allocated funds in the Neighborhood and Community Relations Special Revenue Fund to be used to support um, the full one-time increase in spending of 420,000. The increase in expenditure budget in the um, fund is one time and will be used to increase the base funding for all neighborhoods to 20,000 in 2022. And if there's a second, I can speak to this. I could speak to it anyway. You can speak to it anyway. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is um, money that would essentially add $5,000 in base funding for all the neighborhoods throughout the city. Uh, the sources um, I worked on carefully with staff and finance and also in um, NCR um, to look at unallocated money um, the, what we're using for the 334,000 is a portion of interest that came in on the, I think roughly $26 million that we're holding from NRP funding. So there's a small bit of money, relative speaking to our city budget, a large amount, I guess, of interest. It comes in every year off of, off of that. And this is using a small, uh, reasonably sized, I guess, percentage of that um, the 334,000. And then also there's $86,000 in money that was set aside for a neighborhood organization that never formed and still hasn't. This is the university neighborhood. Now, if it does form, then funding will come its way in the future. But we held back some money. Uh, I was hoping that they would form and develop. So together, um, that got us enough money so that we could increase the base funding to the neighborhoods um, by 5,000 each. I was actually seeking a lot more money um, IFC neighborhoods working really hard on neighborhoods 2020. They're working hard on their community engagement and some of them are still struggling on the base funding as they have insurance needs and, and basic staffing needs and space needs like that. And I think this will give them a little one time funding support. And my hope is that maybe in 2022 we can come up with some different mixes of funding so we can have a better balance. I. Um, as you may recall from other discussions, was actually hoping we could get it to 25,000. And I actually was hoping we could put more money into our um, um, uh, equity and funding for the neighborhoods as well. But this is where I've landed for today and I'd appreciate your support. Thank you. Can you remind me who, has the clerk been able to successfully capture who seconded this motion? I think it was Council President Bender. Thank you, Council President Bender. Um, Council Member Goodman. I just want to thank you, Council Member Gordon. I am really grateful and I know the neighborhoods will be really grateful and I think it's a big deal that you did this work behind the scenes in order to make this happen. And I just wanted to publicly thank you and I know that the neighborhoods that have been such a strong support of the economic recovery and all of their mutual aid work during the civil unrest is being somewhat recognized. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. I wonder, Council Member Gordon, can you clarify that 86,000 is coming from the the money that had that you had worked uh, and that I had supported setting aside for the university neighborhood? And I know Marcy Holmes has been in conversations about uh, you know some sort of merger, and I think those funds are potentially useful for that. And so I, I I'm concerned about supporting this uh, from that source. I just want I want to see if you have any clarification you can offer because uh, I don't want to un undermine a Ward 3 neighborhood and their efforts to create a, a merger that would invite some uh, uh, university residents who are currently unrepresented in a neighborhood association into a neighborhood. 
And I also was concerned about that and did ask, and I asked um, Steve Gallagher about it and Karen Mo, um, and got assurances that should the merger form, should the organization be developed, there would be funding then to go towards that. But they had, um, in the course of the year, or maybe it was even a little bit longer that we'd had these funds, they weren't interested or able to access them, and they hadn't formed that organization yet. So. Um, I've been assured that if and when they do, and I'm hoping that they will in some form or another, and maybe it won't be an official neighborhood organization. You've been watching it carefully with me and they're looking at options. Um, and I don't know if anybody is uh, here from staff who could offer those reassurances too, but I did ask about that and I wanted to make sure that funds would be available for them when they get organized. Um, they weren't able to spend them to help with the organization at this point though. Is Madam Chair, maybe we could just, I, I, I don't see, I'll look on the participation list. I don't think I see anybody. Maybe the city coordinator could add something, but it actually was definitely department staff that I talked to. I can add one comment. Um, oh, Karen, Karen Mose here. I can answer a budget question if that's all right, Chair Paul Masano. I would just say that this um, this is using funds that have not been spent. It doesn't impact future plan spending on neighborhoods. So we're not doing anything to take out way allocations for a potential um, neighborhood associate or neighborhood in the future. This just address unspent things that have already been allocated. But I'll defer to, to Karen Mo for more detail. We have Director Mo and also Cheyenne Brodeen here uh, from NCR. Director Mo. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm acting director, Karen Moe of Neighborhood and Community Relations. And as Amelia said, that's correct. So this is just funds that have been allocated in the past. It will not impact any future funding. So if those organizations merge, um, there will be funding made available to all of the neighborhoods involved. <clears throat> I'll also note that there actually is funding available to assist those organizations to merge if that's what they decide to do. Does that complete your um, questions for now, Council Member Fletcher? Uh, it does, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other, is there any other discussion on this item? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. This motion carries. Colleagues, I'm gonna pause right here to see what the will is of my colleagues. Would you like to power through um, and see how long it takes us to get to the end? If not, now might be an appropriate time for a pause. Um, go ahead and give me a little bit more feedback here. The initial comment that I've seen says power through. All right, then we will. Uh, motion. Uh, how about this? We're going to take a short five minute break after which we will, um, we're going to recess committee for just five minutes to allow for um, just people grabbing a quick snack or, or whatever they might need in these five minutes. Um, so, uh, Mr. Clerk, is it appropriate for me to just declare a pause and a recess and say we will reconvene at 1150 a.m.? Madam Chair, that's that's perfectly fine. Super. Um, colleagues and staff, thank you for being with us and the, the watching public. We are going to take a five minute break at this point in time. We will reconvene at 1150.
All right. Um, it's 11.50, just turned into 11.51, and we are back. Mr. Clerk, do we want to see about a roll call, or should we just assume that everybody um, was able to meet that five-minute window? Uh, Madam Chair, I think it's appropriate to just continue. Sounds good. Um, just enough time to try and make a quick sandwich and make a huge mess in my kitchen here. <laughs> um, item number six is being shown on the screen uh, was a successful motion and we're going to start again um, with item number seven. Um, so here we go. Uh, I am bringing this amendment forward in collaboration and efforts with the clerk's office. So let me um, just go ahead. We did not do roll call. We're just going to um, move on. So I'd like to move this amendment. Many of you are familiar with it because we've been trying to cobble money together for this effort in the past. Um, this is about being able to take um, money in the Intergovernmental Services Fund for the IT department for the purpose of creating a constituent relationship management system finally uh, to support constituent services. And as we move into this new term and a new council uh, and a new legislative setup uh, or government restructuring, I think that this will help us to streamline operations. It will help improve the reporting capabilities for the city's elected officials. And essentially the source of this is leftover ward budget money um, of which we will have a more exact number, I believe, uh, right before budget markup, but it is roughly $175,000. Um, I'd like to make this motion. Is there a second on this motion? Is there a second on this motion? Second. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call that one for Fletcher. Council Member Fletcher seconds the motion. Um, is there any discussion? I also have Clerk Casey Carl, who's able and ready to speak to some of the details of this if that is desired. We might all already know this because this is something we've been trying to do for quite some time. Mr. Carl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't need to belabor the point. I know the council members are well aware of this. I do want to, however, add my thanks to both the um, uh, innovation design technology members of the clerk's office, Grant Johnson and Charlie Ito for their work on this, but also to all of the current and former council staff who have worked to help us design. Uh, we actually were able to successfully get the ongoing maintenance funding already into the budget. This funding is simply to complete the design work to build the constituent relationship management system, which we hope to do in very short order next year. So this would give us the ability to complete design and implement, and then we have the maintenance budget already. So many, many of your aides contributed to um, both the needs analysis and the, the uh, initial design phase. So I anticipate this work will be expedited because of their investment of time in helping us understand how we can help ward offices better in supporting your constituents. So thank you to your your staff, um, both current and former, who all contributed to the success of this project thus far. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else in queue uh, for discussion at this time, so I'll invite the clerk to please call the roll on motion number seven. Council Member Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Council Member Goodman. Jenkins. Council Member Jenkins. Kano. Aye. 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 Bender. Jenkins, aye. Thank you, Council Member Jenkins. Council Member Bender. Aye. Lisa. Lisa. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. 
Fletcher. Aye. Goodman. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. That motion carries. Next up is amendment number eight. Amendment number eight is brought by Council Vice President Jenkins. I'll recognize Council Vice President to introduce this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am bringing forth this um, amendment um, to identify funds to support a, um, a poet laureate. Uh, in the city of Minneapolis. We have a statewide poet laureate. We have a St. Paul poet laureate. I think there's a St. Louis Park poet laureate. Uh, we have no such um, um, reality in the city of Minneapolis. I've been working with um, um, Council Member Fletcher uh, uh, and the Arts Commission staff to bring this um, work forward. Um, I'm really excited about it. The funds are coming from the um, the budgeted funds uh, to the new arts department. Um, and so we're not necessarily uh, bringing it from uh, outside source. And um, I ask my colleagues to support it. And I thank Council Member uh, Gordon for the second. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this item? Council Member Fletcher. Uh, thank you, Chair Palmasano. I just want to thank uh, Council Vice President Jenkins uh, for her collaboration on this. This was something that uh, several of my constituents have very persistently asked uh, me to pursue. And uh, it's it's a very, very small budget item in the grand scheme of all the very important stuff that we're funding and and uh, we're we're rightly putting most of our uh, efforts into public safety and housing and and the the big weighty issues of the day. But I think it's very important to take a little bit of time to uh, and a little bit of resources to uh, to make our city a little more beautiful and 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 to add art as uh, as a part of our city processes. And I'm excited that we're going to be able to, my hope is that by by setting aside this very small amount of money for this, uh, that we also create a platform for some of the participants to raise additional funds and and to leverage the city's support into into building a more robust literary program. Uh, and uh, I'm really grateful to the uh, extremely vibrant and active literary program that we have uh, in the literary community that we have in the Twin Cities. Uh, that is supporting this and, and that has stepped up to participate and uh, and to the Arts Commission. This was really a good opportunity for us. You know, they had asked uh, uh, over the last couple of years for the council to engage with the Arts Commission more and this gave us a good context for doing that and it's been a very positive experience and they've stepped up and done uh, terrific work to really outline and and uh, define the the program and and uh, help us get to this point. So I'm I'm grateful to uh, everybody who's worked on this and uh, excited that we can uh, set this up as a program uh, as, as a new thing at the city. Thank you. I do also want to make the clarification that this is a designation of money that is already in uh, our art department capacity building. Um, and so this is just a further designation of what the council wants to do with money that is already in this area. Um, Council Member Gordon. Well, I appreciate this and um, I have no problem with the funding. I actually um, am most excited about the fact that we're going to have a poet laureate and wanted to have a little fun with this. So um, my sister was actually a published poet and she was poet laureate for the city of Duluth. And when that occurred, I was a little bit surprised and disappointed that Minneapolis didn't have a poet laureate. And I'm so delighted that we will um, have that coming forward and really appreciate council member Jenkins and Fletcher for, for working on this. Thank you. And I love um, the promotion of your sister. <laughs> Um, I also forgot when I was introducing this to note that Jenkins and Fletcher are both the authors here. It was wrong on my sheet. I must have printed it out a little bit early. Um, thank you for both of your work on this. Um, I must say that um, it, when this first came up in the public hearing last month, I did reach out to Council Vice President Jenkins and said, wait, I thought you were the poet laureate, but it was an elected <laughs> position now. 
Um, so I will call on Council Vice President Jenkins. Go ahead. Well, thank you. I will call on Council Member Gordon to please read a short poem from his sister's uh, collection. Oh my goodness. Um, okay, if, if she has short ones, I can read a little bit. Here's one called Untethering. She imagines she can live in one sparse room, a slender bed, a single chair beside a window. But by bit, she gives her past away. The china teacups wrung with strands of tiny violets, the rosary, the ring, as if she is unfastening her history, one button at a time. The old poems make a beautiful fire. She writes a new one by its light. She writes the open, and she writes the window open to the moon. She writes the dunes, she writes the sea. From Impasse yes. by Jeff. Um, thank you, council member, and um, thank your sister as well. That was gorgeous, thank you. Seeing nothing further, um, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on item number eight. Council member Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Kano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That motion carries. Next, we have amendment number nine. It is brought by council members Cano and Gordon. Um, which, who shall I recognize to introduce this amendment? Council Member Cano? Yeah, I can go first and then I'll share with uh, Council Member Gordon. Why don't you go ahead and then move it and then Gordon can speak first and second it. Great, thank you. I will um, go ahead and, and move our motion. Uh, Madam Chair, should I go ahead and read the motion and then wait for a second? You can go ahead and summarize it as you best see fit. Please make sure you're specific about the dollar amounts, where they're coming from and where they're going to. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Okay. So um, Council Member Gordon and I have a motion here that is um, about supporting the City Coordinator's Office, the Sustainability Division um, explicitly with a $100,000 one-time fund allocation that would be coming from, I believe it is the uh, Minneapolis Police Department um, Reserve for Law Enforcement Assistance with um, coming from other jurisdictions. And um, it's related to the evaluation and recommended improvements for the work of green zones which includes um, geographies in North Minneapolis and in South Minneapolis. So I will um, go ahead and, and make that motion and would appreciate a second. Second. Thank you. This motion has been made by Council Member Cano and seconded by Council Member Gordon. Uh, Council Member Gordon, go ahead. Thanks, I can just speak to this briefly. This is something um, that actually came from the green zones. They were asking for it and from sustainability staff. It was something I um, believe that actually they were asking for $250,000. It didn't make it into the mayor's um, budget, but we think it's something very valuable and maybe the work can be accomplished successfully with a little bit less money. So we 
you know, are asking for $1,000 in one-time funds to help uh, make the most of this green zones. I think this is um, the green zones is really a sweet spot for us where we can look at how we address climate change and even in a daily basis, these green zones happen to be have temperatures that are typically higher and air quality is lower than the rest of the city. Um, but while we're addressing climate change, we're also addressing climate justice. And I think if we have a little money, we can have a lot bigger bang for our buck, so to speak, um, with making sure that there are benefits for the city. I'd appreciate folks supporting this. Um, the money is coming out of um, um, the MPD's budget, um, but we know that they did have a large increase. Um, we tried to go after what we thought was a um, area where they might not even be able to spend all the money and just taking a hundred thousand dollars from um, the law enforcement assistance in the police department reserve. So I hope that's acceptable to folks here. Thank you. Now I'll open it up to discussion. Are there questions or comments from other council members? I will put myself in queue um, and see. I'm not sure if um, Mr. Havey is on the line, but I did want to ask him. Um, I understand that the ask to take on this next piece of work, um, really important work for climate change, was an ask for $250,000. And I'm just wondering what you would be able to do with $100,000 of it. Um, it sounds like the authors have been working closely with you on it. Um, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts. I understand he's not on the call. Um, is Director Johnston available to speak a, a little bit to this item? Director Johnston, thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot here, um, but I am curious if you can speak to the collaboration that's gone on here about green zones and seeing is this would this money be valuable in the sustainability department to do as outlined um it doesn't um, seem like enough for an fte to do this work and it is one time money yeah madam madam chair uh council members um unfortunately i don't have a deep background on this um but uh as you as you noted it's only a hundred thousand of one-time dollars so it would have to be a contractual pieces a contractual um hire as opposed as as noted for the consultant to work on this issue um i don't have as i said i don't have a lot of background but we will um uh, we'll definitely get some more information from mr havey i don't know if you want to move on to a different amendment and come back to this one otherwise we'll try to reach mr havey as well um, obviously, as, as noted, it wasn't included in the mayor's budget, so I don't have a lot of background on it. I just uh, joined the meeting right now. I just uh, Ken just invited me, and this is Kim Havey. Welcome, Mr. Havey. Hi. Um, I understand from Councilmember Cano that this hundred thousand dollar amendment into your department from um, extra staffing one time for the police department would be used not for for consultants and evaluation, not for adding staff to your department to in, to increase the work of the green zones work plans. Could you speak a little bit more to this? Sure, yes. Yeah, that is correct. Um, we're really at an important stage right now with our, our green zones where we have gone through and developed um, uh, work plans that both have sort of short term and five year uh, plan goals in, in place. We've been uh, did a presentation in September on that. And so what we're looking with this funding is to really be able to move the green zones into, into kind of the next phase on how they're working with these uh, particular work plan items um, and to really support kind of evaluation of on what, what's, what's the future look like for green zones. They've been really under a, a direction to really come up with the work plans and to act as an advisory, but uh, but we're really kind of thinking about what does it mean long term now that we've had them for uh, since 2017 and we've been working on these work plans as our main uh, focus, but now we're like, what does it mean in the future with environmental justice um, efforts? And that may mean 
potentially combining the, the green zones or potentially uh, having other activities within another outside organization or continuing on as a as a advisory board and commission to the to the city. But we want to go through a process to be able to kind of figure out what's next and how they can um, best support the plans that they've laid out. But it is not for specific, it is not for uh, staffing for the actual Office of Sustainability. Thank you. And um, I think this next question is probably best suited to Director Kruver. It's my understanding that um, an expense like this might might be in a gray area in terms of it being an ARPA eligible expense, um, but that needing extra one time funds for law enforcement probably would be an ARPA eligible expense. Is that accurate? Yes, and I'll, I'll go you one further and say that uh, ARPA funds for uh, additional contracts with law enforcement was included indeed in the first round of ARPA funds. So that would remain eligible. Harder to say for, for these kinds of climate focused programs because of that direct link to response to the pandemic is a little bit more gray. So that's exactly right. Right, all right, thank you. Um, is there any further discussion or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none. I will ask the clerk to call the roll, please, on amendment number nine. Councilmember Reich. Nay. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. No. Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. No. There are nine ayes and three nays. Thank you. That item passes. Next, we will move on to motion number 10, but actually I have um, I would like to delay motion number 10. Um, colleagues, as you know, uh, our colleague, Councilmember Osman, has undergone um, some serious family emergencies these past few weeks, and um, he has expressed interest to me to waiting to bring this himself um, to us as a council. Nonetheless, I left it in our council packets. Um, so that we could all see it and that the public could see it and it would be out in the open. His intent is as expressed in an email, it is to find $50,000 uh, for homeless response, um, direct one-time uses um, for the health department's homeless response team to bring things into, um, into the encampments when they go to work with the people that live in the encampments and transition into other kinds of housing. Um, I will respect um, Councilmember Osmond's wishes to bring this himself. Um, and so it won't be included in this packet, but I just wanted to share it because it is a complete technically correct amendment. Are there any questions about that? Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just um, curious and I know I want to, you know, I have more questions when the author, Councilmember Osman, is able to present it, but um, is the homeless response team, is that a joint um, county and city um, team or is that solely um, city of Minneapolis Health if anyone is available to answer it. I think there is surely someone available to answer it. I would invite Director Musicant or Director Brennan um, or Katie Topinka if she's on the line. I think it makes great sense, by the way, to have some discussion on this so that when it is time to vote on it, when Osman brings it, that there's just more understanding. Director Brennan, thanks for joining us. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair, Council Vice President Jenkins. I um, the the homeless response uh, team 
um, I think specifically in this, uh, the way that this is worded, it's it's specifically the health department's homeless response team, um, but that term is also used quite frequently to talk about the city and the county collective um, uh, coordinated homeless response uh, team. So I, I think it can get kind of confusing, but I think for the purposes of this um, this budget amendment, it's just the health departments, but um, Commissioner Musicant um, should probably respond to that. The other thing I would just um, offer is, is um, uh, something that we can um, research is whether any of the federal um, emergency funds that we received um, to respond to the pandemic could potentially be used for this um, as well because we do have fund balances there. So I can, um, I will take on researching that since you are um, not taking this up at this moment and um, provide that information. Thank you so much. That would be great. Thank you so much and um, thank you for that. I still don't necessarily have clarity, but I guess yeah, around um, the uh, collaboration, as it were, but maybe uh, Commissioner Musicat may be able to answer that. Sure, I will invite Director Musicant to join us. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll do my best. I'm, I'm texting uh, Noya Woodrich as well, our, our Deputy Commissioner, who is uh, really front and center on, on this part of the work that we're we're doing, um, but yes, we do work hand in glove with others who are out there, both community-based organizations and <clears throat> Hennepin County's uh, Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, having said that, I think that this is um, just part of uh, the, what goes along with the relationships that our outreach folks are forming with people in the community who are homeless and um, being able to respond to some of their immediate needs is, is also nurturing of those relationships and the ultimate goal of all of us working together, both in the city and the county and community-based agencies is of course to help people find more stable housing, but a lot of that depends on the relationships that we form. So that's what I would say at this point, but I will try and get more information um, if there is some and share that with you. Sure, there might be other questions in queue and it might just be good to get them to get them out into the open and then Osman um, can consider next week whether he wants to still bring this amendment or whether it's taken care of in some other way. Council Member Cano. Uh, before you move on, Madam oh, Chair. Sure, sure. I just wanted to just, um, you know, thank the responders and also, um, um, I, you know, I, 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 I think our, the American, um, rescue plan is really specifically sort of um, intended for exactly this kind of um, community level support. So if, if we do have uh, funds, and I know we have another tranche coming up, um, that it seems to be more appropriate than depleting the, the already minimal art department uh, funds that are um, that have been allocated or budgeted in this cycle. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Cano. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm curious uh, about a couple of things here. Um, what is the definition of consumables? Um, it's quite a broad category and um, and I'm just curious about what specifically we are hoping to consume um, so I can have a better understanding of what precise gap we're trying to fill. Are we talking about food? Are we talking about band-aids? Are we talking about needles? Like what, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to collect that question for now as we're working to get uh, Deputy Commissioner Woodrich into the meeting. Um, but I that have, is a good open question. Did you have others or more? Yeah, I, it wasn't really clear to me based on the language presented here if this is a one time move of money for a one time use and purpose 
or if they were referring to the consumables being a one-time use. I think that's something we could clear up for our with our budget director, Director Kruver. Yes, thank you, Chair Palmasano, and thanks for the question, Councilmember Cano. This is a one-time movement of funds from the art uh, change item to the health department. So for one year, after which that fifty thousand dollars would revert back to the arts department in an ongoing way. Yes, and correct. we'd be using this money because it's the general fund money, so it's more flexible than other things might be. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, do, um, Director Kruver, do you feel like that language is clear here? Because if if this motion moves forward in some capacity, I just wouldn't want there to be any misunderstanding that this is somehow ongoing or something like that. Yes, thank you, Councilmember Kondo. I think we can clean up that language, especially if we're going to take it up a little bit later. I will also note that there is a coding error that I'm working with the uh, clerk's office to fix right now. So we can add some um, some more language to clarify that it's a one time only move. And lastly, I'll share that. Um, you know, the city, the city has a pretty extensive, complicated and broad um, body of work on addressing the needs of uh, families and people who are experiencing homelessness. So this does feel a little out of step with that, um, particularly the um, lack of clarity in the uh, gap it's trying to fill um, and the, the source. I'll just share that um, I would not be able to, to support this motion with the source identified. I think that we've had a lot of conversations right now um, that have identified other viable sources for um, a one-time $50,000 allocation, but I wouldn't be able to support it coming from the, uh, the city's arts uh, work, primarily because um, you know, out of the $271 million that the city of Minneapolis received from the federal government in ARPA dollars, uh, only $300,000 went to any and all arts related work at the city. So that's a huge inequity, understanding that um, the sector of arts and culture in our city is uh, largely represented by people of color and um, communities, diverse communities and multilingual communities in Minneapolis. Additionally, we did approve an ordinance to stand up a new arts and cultural affairs department to help the city improve the way that we provide services, uh, support and initiatives for the uh, arts and cultural sector of our city, which is a pretty, um, a pretty significant sector when it comes to the economy. Uh, whether you think about uh, community centers like juxtaposition arts or individual entrepreneurs and business owners, um, you know, diff different artists that have started a lot of different initiatives and pretty much anything, anything we can, we can lay our eyes on has been designed by an artist um, or somebody in the creative sector. And so that department itself asked for $3.5 million to stand it up as phase one and none of that money was allocated through the mayor's budget, um, the one that we're reviewing today and voting on today. So I feel like we're already working with a, a really, um, you know, disinvested uh, conversation in terms of how much resources support and um, strategic um, budgeting has happening has been happening around the arts and cultural work. So I, I don't feel like this is uh, this is an appropriate um, or a complementary use of resources. So I just wanted to share some of that background with um, colleagues and the public as to sort of the state of arts and culture at the city, where we are in the whole $3.5 million, where out of $271 million, only 300,000 has been allocated to arts and cultural work in the entire enterprise. And so um, I certainly think that there is a much better and appropriate source for uh, yet an unidentifiable and quite vague um, proposal here before us. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to mention that our health commissioner um, and deputy, or sorry, uh, our deputy commissioner is having technical difficulties getting 
into the call here. Um, but I'm we're taking some notes and um, I think you know I'm going to pass these back to Councilmember Osman for now, um, so that when Councilmember Osman brings this up next week, he can make sure that he's you know covered his bases on this. We do have three more people in queue on this one, but I'd like to move along quickly because I know we have some staff readied for the next one in queue. Um, but so I'll just see if there's anything more. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Uh, I'll uh, just just briefly thank Director Brennan for uh, noting that there's probably fund balance that the City Council has made a substantial investment in homeless response. Uh, and I really would not want to create the impression for the public or anyone else that uh, it's necessary for us to be scrounging for $50,000 for something that's needed for homeless response right now that uh, that, that this council actually really asked uh, staff uh, if they could deploy more money if we were to allocate it last time we were in the ARPA budget conversation uh, and the answer was no this is what we can get out there and so my expectation is that we have the resources that we need until we hear otherwise and I know there's ARPA round two coming up uh, but I really do hope that we can find uh, uh, you know the resources to do this and and not take it away from you know a department that that does find itself needing to scrounge for five figure dollar amounts to get little programs off the ground uh and and so i i want to echo uh what my colleagues have said about not taking from the arts and and uh and let's find this within the existing uh significant and robust effort that uh this council and our staff have made around homeless response thank you council member cunningham thank you madam chair uh, just briefly, and first I want to apologize to everyone. I have to be on my phone. I'm having some technical difficulties with my computer. Um, so I just want, um, while this is a uh, budget amendment, um, I do want to uh, just make a quick statement um, about looking forward into the future um, about homelessness response um, in the city of Minneapolis. Council Vice President Jenkins asked a question around you know who's at the table and you know what groups are working on this and how are we collaborating and i will just say that um, city of minneapolis staff have been doing uh, phenomenal work uh, with the resources that they have and something that i've consistently heard from them um, with my work in addressing encampments in ward four is that there's just a lack of a system a systematic response um, to homeless encampments in particular. And so, you know, I implore my colleagues who will be returning or any incoming council members who may be watching this meeting um, to please take this issue on, the system gap that exists, um, to please take this on to address it and create a system that will allow for, you know, a systematic, uh, predictable response um, that could be obviously individualized based on, you know, the context of, of each individual in case, but I just, you know, uh, this is, is a pretty severe gap and it's something that I uh, didn't fully see um, until uh, this year when encampments became um, more prevalent in Ward 4. So, um, you know, I, again, I just want to implore upon, uh, you know, uh, implore to council members who are, you know, will be serving next term uh, to please prioritize this as a policy um, issue because it's very unsustainable for our staff to to go to try their best to work within um, a non-existent system. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Council Member Bender is the last in queue on this and we're not going to take a vote on this motion, but I just want to get all the discussion out that we possibly can and then it'll be up to Councilmember Osman where he wants to take it from here. Thanks, Madam Chair. I think a lot of my comments would be redundant, so I'll be really brief and just say I can see why Councilmember Osman um, would want to um, bring something forward. I know Ward 6 is heavily impacted by encampments and as Councilmember Cunningham just said, those of us who have encampments in our wards, it becomes a whole separate full-time uh, job just to manage the encampments. Um, and they're not, you know, which some words have dramatically more impact than others um, across the city as it's in a typical year. Um, you know, I we did add some staff 
using one-time dollars both in CPED and in health during the last budget process. Um, you know, this is one of the examples of a public safety um, issue where we have made a, a sort of policy and practice shift. The city has over time, both formally and informally, moved away from having our police department respond to encampments by clearing people out, which is consistent with our values of treating people with dignity and respect. But we haven't filled that gap with any other kind of support um, from a staffing point of view, but for these handful of staff that we added in the last budget cycle using one-time dollars. I think one of the issues that the comments have highlighted is the struggle between what's in the city's purview and what's in the county's purview. Um, you know, unfortunately, and having been in many, many hours of meetings about this <laughs> statewide, regionally, locally, um, you know, often when things are falling through the gaps in the statewide system or the regional system, it really does fall to the local um, governments, the local communities to respond. And so I think it's important that folks have highlighted the enormous amount of investment that we have made in as a city in responding to homelessness. I think our constituents expect the city to have a response. Right now, the response is very haphazard and there are not clear systems and policies in place. Um, there's a sort of journey for each, each time there's an encampment and our constituents are all very frustrated. So like Councilmember Cunningham said, I really hope that in the future, especially from an operational standpoint, this can be improved so that people have a better understanding of what to expect. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that this, uh, the intention of this amendment can be reached, as others have said, through the ARPA investments. But I do think it's worth highlighting some of the operational challenges that the city is having with responding to encampments in a way that provides for health and safety of everyone in our community, including the folks who are experiencing homelessness. Thank you so much. All right, so seeing no further discussion on this one, I'm just going to um, carry on. If I need a, I don't think I need a motion to table. I just wanted to share this and get it out in the open and have some discussion on it. I will bring this feedback um, and more back to Council Member Osbin. Let's move on to motion number 11, which is the last one that we have here for today. Um, this motion is being brought by council members Bender and Cunningham and I will invite council president Bender to um, to to read it and make the first motion introduce the amendment thank you thank you madam chair um, this motion is by myself and council member Cunningham it's rather lengthy lengthy so I'll go through and go ahead and read it um, and I just want to also note that we have been joined by our Office of Violence Prevention Director, Sasha Cotton, and the Office of Performance and Innovation Director, Brian Smith, as well as their respective department heads, who will be able to um, answer detailed questions about this proposal. So this um, amendment would amend the mayor's 22 recommended budget um, to increase spending in the health department by three and a half million dollars. Um, it would provide funding for a system of information management that would allow the Office of Violence Prevention and the other health systems, some of which are, are in the coordinator's office, some of which are in health, to track their interactions with the public. Um, the second piece is to provide trauma, set stress, and mental health support for the violence prevention providers who are not city employees and therefore do not receive health insurance. The third is to um, expand coverage of the Minneapolis Strategic Outreach Initiative. It will provide funding for adolescent specific group violence intervention. It will provide funding to supplement the Violence Prevention Fund, um, funding for stabilization of high risk individuals who are served through these programs, funding to support community members who've experienced trauma resulting from exposure to violence, as well as um, expanding the violence prevention through built environment changes, uh, providing actually the first time funding for violence prevention through built environment pilot. Uh, the second piece of this would, so all of that is in the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, it is expanding and supporting the existing services which are in high demand. Um, and again, Director Cotton is with us. All of this came directly from the staff who are leading this work and they will be able to answer any specific questions that folks may have. The second piece is for the work that is in the coordinator's office. Um, 
in the Office of Performance and Innovation. This is the team that has been working through the staff direction that this um, council gave unanimously in 2018 to go through and analyze all of the problem nature codes. Why are people calling 911? Looking through all of the data to see how our system of safety is working now to provide for the services and safety needs of our community and to prototype, analyze, and evaluate investments. Um, they have made multiple um, uh, presentations to the Public Health and Safety Committee through the years, and all of the 911 MPD workgroup um, results are also documented and publicly available. So this would, um, you know, I think really the the staff team would say they need um, additional FTEs to continue this work, but this would provide contracting support in the absence of additional staff capacity. The funding source for these two pieces is general fund balance. It is the same funding source that the mayor's proposed budget is using for $17 million um, in funding. Um, those increases are not itemized in the proposed budget, but in the budget book, it describes those funds generally going to elections as well as um, police related lawsuits. And that is included in the total of $34 million in the mayor's proposed 2022 budget that is going for um, worker compensation claims and lawsuits related to the police department. 10 million of that is in the police department and you may remember that um, 24 million of that is in the self-insurance fund. Um, you know, I'll just, so that is the detailed description. I'll go ahead and move it. I'll also just briefly comment that this um, proposal does two things. It is another step forward toward our shared vision for public safety in Minneapolis that will provide the tools that we need to keep every member of our community safe by providing the right response to a call for help. Some people call this transforming public safety. Some people call this a both and approach to public safety. Um, regardless of the words that we have used, every elected official in office and those who are joining um, next term have voiced strong support for having a more robust and effective system of safety in our city. This investment is based on years of work dating to the first blueprint for youth violence prevention in 2006 and based on the detailed analysis of 911 calls that the council initiated by unanimous direction in 2018. The investment also represents a reaction to the realities of our current system of safety. Um, despite dramatic increases in the police department's budget, their level of service is down and the police department itself is increasingly requesting support from the Office of Violence Prevention and the other public safety services throughout the city. Like any other kind of city service, this needs funding to be able to, um, to provide the services that are needed. So uh, with that, I will close and turn it over to my co-author, Councilmember Cunningham. I will note that, you know, honestly, I prepared this amendment. I started talking with staff um, kind of as a backup. Um, I had expected maybe some of the other council members or others um, to make a proposal, but no one did. So I was happy to step forward and bring this for consideration today. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this motion has been made by Council President Bender and sorry, I was eating off screen here. Um, and I now will call on Council Member Cunningham to second the motion and to speak more to this amendment that he's also an author of. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will second this motion. Um, thank you for the space to be able to um, speak to this um, to this item. So this, I am invested in the safety of our city. Um, Council, uh, Council President Bender is as well, which is why the two of us brought this forward, um, because we have to face the reality that MPD is down by a few hundred officers, and it is going to take time in order to uh, fill those ranks back to um, the previous staffing levels, even just to what we were in 2019. So what that means is that we are experiencing um, a significant gap in public safety services um, that we have uh, historically and presently relied on police in order to respond, but we no longer really have that option. So what that means is that there has to be 
more public safety systems and options in order to fill that gap. And to Council President Bender's point, um, we know that MPD is more and more frequently calling upon the Office of Violence Prevention uh, to fill these gaps. Um, and so if this is, uh, this is just a reality. You know, we, we find money in every nook and cranny um, to continue to uh, put more money into MPD, despite the fact that we are getting diminishing amounts of services. We have to be able to take a step back and see that these sort of public safety uh, strategies and systems right now are not negotiable because we can't just wait until MPD re, uh, replenishes its staffing levels, wait for a uh, set of recommendations um, from a committee that doesn't have public health experts on it, except for our city staff. Um, and so like we, these are evidence-based strategies that can help fill the public safety gaps that we are facing as a city. So I just wanna be able to, to walk through just very briefly. These, again, these are evidence-based, meaning, for example, um, there is in, increasing demand uh, for violence interrupters in different scenarios. We, we created violence interrupters uh, to fill a particular kind of gap, but what we're seeing is that there are more requests in different spaces and different contexts. So we need to continue to expand that in order to fill that gap. Um, what we saw in 2020, um, and, I've, and I've been talking about this now for a few years, is that we have to be focusing on our young people who are gang and group involved um, because they are largely behind, for example, carjacking. Um, and so we would be dealing with multiple issues um, at one time um, that doesn't rely so heavily on the police to do everything. Instead, we have experts who focus on particular parts of it. So for the Violence Prevention Fund, their urgency is there because we need to invest in community-based public safety strategies. Um, like we have, like we are going to be, we have been and will continue to rely on community members in order to fill the gaps. We have to invest in that. Um, one of the biggest things we hear from people who are trying to get out of the life and are struggling to get out of it is that they have housing instability. They have food instability and security. Um, this, uh, the $300,000, that helps to transition people out of the life and help their basic needs be met. Um, and then, you know, I'll just say to the last, last item um, or to, um, 1H um, is that this is actually based on environmental criminology, um, what's called situa situational crime prevention. Um, this is evidence-based. So again, we have to change the environment to change people's behaviors, and that is what this will do. Again, it helps to fill a gap because it's preventing violence from happening before it happens, and this is evidence-based. So, and, you know, we have relied so heavily on the Office of Performance and Innovation to fill the massive gap that we we asked city staff last June to create a transforming community safety process and that was never fully operationalized and as such we have relied on the Office of Performance and Innovation. As such we have seen the more fundamental work of the Office of Performance and Innovation so you know uh, the budget about like um, as, as, uh, excuse me like looking at the budget around performance and evaluation um, really looking at how are we innovating uh, city systems and 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 um, processes so um, so this is just really important so that we can have actually um, that work continue while also being able to get to the fundamentals as well so I just I, I implore upon people to please not treat this as though this is optional, because I can say as a council member who lives in North Minneapolis, lives in one of the hottest hotspots um, in North Minneapolis, we cannot wait a couple of years. Um, if there are recommendations from anyone as to a different source of funding, we will gladly welcome that. 
However, from our perspective, given the fact that this is such, there's such urgency here um, to do this now rather than waiting for the second phase of ARPA, for example, um, we, we welcome that. Um, so with that, I, I will pause. Um, I think uh, Mayor Fry is in queue. So if uh, anybody has any questions or additional thoughts, I'm happy um, to respond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call on um, on Mayor Fry and then Council Member Goodman. Um, I will say that this amendment has been moved by Council Member Bender, seconded by Council Member Cunningham, and now we are in the discussion phase of this proposal. And this is our last one of the of of the amendments that we have before us. Welcome, Mayor Fry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Council Members, for your work and the opportunity to speak here. Uh, and thank you to Council President Bender and, and Council Member Cunningham, the authors of this particular uh, motion. Uh, this really should be and could be a moment for unity here. Uh, these items, let me be very clear, should be funded. These items will be funded. These items are the exact same recommendations that are coming through in the second phase of ARPA and were simply moved from the recommendations given by Office of Violence Prevention for ARPA phase two to this reserve fund within this budget. And so these are the recommendations that were intended to come through ARPA and I believe should come through ARPA. Uh, there er is both an urgency in making sure that this funding moves forward, but also a necessity that we're doing the right things uh, by our city budgeting and uh, by our financial decisions to making sure that we are on steady footing 100% of the time. So uh, I mentioned we will be further funding it through the second phase of ARPA. I think we all agree, every single one of us, that the Office of Violence Prevention is doing this very important and urgent work. Uh, the money can't get spent regardless uh, of whether it goes through ARPA or through the, uh, the budget in the next couple of months. It simply can't get spent in that amount of time. Uh, and so uh, I would ask strongly that instead of funding it through the reserve fund, which our financial department has recommended strongly against, uh, that we do it through ARPA phase two. Uh, we're, we're gonna keep funding at the speed that we can deliver using appropriate financial responsible sources of funding. And what is important right now is giving OVP the time and the space to implement their critically important work that is currently funded so that they can achieve the results that we believe that this work will ultimately yield. Uh, so we're committed to, to move nimbly to expand this funding, uh, such as using that additional ARPA fund when OVP are ready to expand or introduce these new initiatives. I believe that they should be tackled. And as I mentioned, these are the exact same proposals that OVP was moving through ARPA. Um, and I'll, I'll just reiterate some of the things that have already been stated by our financial experts, uh, which I feel is important to really listen to them. Uh, the general guidelines from government finance professionals are that cities should reserve between around 20 and 30 percent of unallocated funds to safeguard a city's financial resiliency, especially during difficult times like an economic recession or an uncertain pandemic. Our financial policy sets the bare minimum at 17%, but as our finance team shared with the council just last night, the reduction considered in this amendment is strongly discouraged. Uh, going below the target increases, uh, the financial risk to be able to weather some unexpected expenses, such as responding to the pandemic or future fluctuations in sales tax. Uh, these are the financial considerations that we really need to care for and balance. Uh, in the form of the reserve fund. That's what the reserve fund is indeed intended for. So I really appreciate the, the motion. I do. Uh, I agree with, with these items of work and they need to be funded. They will be funded. Um, I think the, the only area, uh, as far as I can tell, where there is any disagreement as to whether they should come out of the reserve fund, I would argue they should instead come out of ARPA. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for Ms. Kruver. Is she on the line still? Yes, of yeah. course she okay. is. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kruver, I understand that OVP is funded through a variety of sources and there is ARPA phase one money that has been put into OVP as well as other grant funds. 
like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, we um, often allocate money that it's not spent, then we sweep it back up and put it out again for RFP. How much money is left from the original allocation of 2.47 million from the first phase of ARPA? And also how much money is left from other grants? I think we had about $2 million budgeted from other grants. How much of that money is remaining? Seems to me as though there is a lot of money still to be spent. And so if they can spend that money between now and phase two, we wouldn't have to cut into the uh, reserve fund in order to fund this because if, if they're out of money, yes, of course, I agree. We should do something to make sure that doesn't happen. But if there's millions of unspent money, that would tide them over until ARPA phase two. So I'm wondering if we could hear more from staff about that. Yes, thank you, Councilmember Goodman for the question. So you're correct in ARPA phase one, so this July, we appropriated 2.47 million for OVP in total for uh, public safety related projects. To date, there remains 2.1 million left to be spent. So still a substantial amount to be spent. I will say that we've just done a round of, of sort of progress reports with all of our departments that received ARPA phase one. And it sounds like they have done a lot of groundwork, setting up contracts, determining the right direction and sort of all of the activity that you would need to get started. And it sounds like they will be able to start spending these dollars in earnest in the next month or two. Um, but you are correct, at this point, we have 2.1 million left to spend in the ARPA funds. Um, to your second question in our sort of other funds section, so in, in the federal grants fund for things like um, the C, C, uh, CBDG funds, which I always get wrong when I say it, um, there is also $2 million budgeted for 2020, uh, 2021, I mean and left is 1.4 million remaining to be spent. So a good amount of grant dollars remain to be spent for the year in OVP related spending. Madam Chair, is it my turn? Yes, continue. Okay, thanks. Um, so that adds up to like about 3.5 million. So it's about what this proposal is and we're hearing that ARPA is a good use for phase two is a good use for these kinds of things as well. Uh, and I agree with Council Member Cunningham that Director Cotton should speak because I do think that actually she's kind of set up for failure in the scenario where we're constantly tossing money here and then expecting she's going to do things immediately when she's actually one of the most thoughtful department leaders we have and is trying to do things in, a, um, in the right way. And so I do think supporting her leadership is important. She's probably going to explain to us how she's going to get this money out, but consistently putting money into this that can't be spent is not a setup for um, success either. And I'm happy to defer to her. Thank you. Welcome Thank Director you. Cotton. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you're building capacity in your department and to answer Council Member Goodman's inquiries? Yes, thank you, Chair Palmasano, and thank you, Councilmember Goodman, for the question. Um, as it relates to the existing ARPA resources that have been allocated, uh, I think the balance that was mentioned reflects actual spending and not contract allocation, and maybe Ms. Kruger can speak to that, because there are a number of contracts that have either been established, which our process takes a long time. I mean, I think it's just worth noting that inside of the city system, in order to amend contracts, and particularly with um, ARP money, there are a lot of steps to enter into contracts so that people can start spending the money. So I know that a number of contracts, as I mentioned yesterday in my presentation to the council, um, sub the committee around public health and public safety, there are a number of contracts that are in queue for the Office of Balance Prevention Fund and a number of contracts that are out for signature, I believe, for our interrupter teams that will draw that balance down significantly, probably by well over a million dollars. Um, so I just want to be really clear that um, we are always trying to be thoughtful and planful um, and position the folks that are doing the work with us for success. Um, we want to make sure that they can anticipate what kind of resources they're going to have to work with. And I think that's the biggest challenge here is I don't know what the timeline is on the ARP dollars. And so it'd be helpful to know what the expectation is around when those dollars might become available for round two for us to make 
about our assessment around need. But what I can say is, as we go into 2022 and try to do planning with our partners, we run the risk always of people walking away if they don't know if they're going to have the money to do the work, particularly going into spring and summer. And we often run into a situation where because there are contracting issues, so once we get the money, it still takes us roughly somewhere between six and eight weeks to get a contract set up and fully executed. Um, so the more time we have with dollars in queue to be able to do that work during our colder weather months, the better off we are so that we can make sure that folks have the money they need to do the work as the weather changes and we know that we expect to see increases in the need for our services. So we are um, thoughtfully spending our existing ARP money and we are trying to be planful for, for resources based on either current budget, you know, the 22 general budget or ARP dollars. It'd be, like I said before, helpful to know when those ARP dollars might become available. And then um, I think secondly, as it pertains to grant dollars, when we have federal grant dollars, um, which I believe are what the, the grant dollars that Ms. Kruger is referring to, those are earmarked dollars. So we've applied to do a particular project and we're funded to do that work. Uh, in particular, the bulk of that money is uh, through a CDC grant, which is specifically focused on our work with Minneapolis public schools and creating um, increased safety in the schools. So none of this project area work is able to be funded through any of our federal grants because that money is dedicated to specific projects different from these things. So I just think that those are pieces of insight that the council should have as they make their decision. And I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have further. Thank you. Council Member Goodman, do you have any further questions? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate the discussion and um, certainly, oh, did I freeze? We can still hear you just fine. So okay. Like you did for like a I second. Froze for a minute. Um, certainly appreciate the discussion. I'm glad we are able to hear from the staff who put this proposal together. Um, we haven't yet heard from from Mr. Smith from um, for the second piece of this. So would welcome anything he would like to say about the continued investment in developing out our public safety system. You know, I did since we're we sort of began talking about the the budgetary piece of this. I don't want to distract from the um, places of agreement and the important work that it sounds like we all support. So I'm really excited to hear that there there should be support for this proposal to be approved as part of this budget process. Um, you know, I'm hearing concern about the use of fund balance. The mayor's proposed 2022 budget uses $17 million of fund balance, essentially for covering the costs of lawsuits to the city. The total levy increase was $21.5 million. The total cost of increases for lawsuits related to our police department in the mayor's 2022 budget is $34 million, $10 million in MPD fringe, $12 million in moving money from the general fund to the self-insurance fund for worker compensation claims and another $12 million moving funds from the general fund to the self-insurance fund for police violence related lawsuits. I just, I need to understand, I think in the, in the context of this discussion, why finance and the mayor have proposed that use of fund balance, you know, what, what kind of analysis went into um, that, you know, being comfortable with using that much fund balance for those uses. Um, and so that resulted in that proposal for the 2022 budget. Sure, I'm going to invite Director Kruver to talk about that, but I do just want to explain the process in general is that every year um, we do as a government unit use some of our cash reserves. Um, finance department is um, tasked with figuring out how much of cash reserves that are unobligated to and don't have these strings attached should be used in the development of the mayor's budget. That is what that recommendation is made in a way uh, that happens even before the levy is set so that we know how much of our cash reserves will we use that year to help us set an appropriate stable levy in a five year financial plan. So this is this using this kind of a um, source at this end of the process is 
something I don't think we've ever done before. Um, that $17 million or Director Kruver can refine that number if needed is set to the city as we first develop our budget. It is not recommended that we go beyond that. It is not recommended as a place that responsible council members should be taking money from, no matter how much we all like um, the kinds of things that are proposed. It is seen as a dangerous process. Our CFO um, wrote us an extensive memo that went into great detail about this last night. I've entered that into the public record. Um, but I'd like to invite Director Kruver just to um, to answer the council president's question about how we determine how much we are going to use. And to be clear, Madam Chair, I, I understand the process and I also serve on the Board of Estimate and Taxation that sets the maximum levy. I've commented extensively on this in public. My question, I guess, to be more specific and clear, why was the levy set to increase the total levy at $21.5 million? when the total cost of increased law lawsuits is covered to be $34 million. Why was it decided, and this maybe is more of a question to the mayor who proposed the budget, to use fund balance reserves to pay for police related lawsuits instead of increasing the levy to pay for those increased expenses? That is my question. Whoever wants to answer it, if there is an answer. I'm, I'm happy to get started, Council President Bender and Chair Palmasano. So <clears throat> I'll speak a little bit just to my area of expertise, which is the process and our general best practices that we follow when we are recommending an amount of accumulated fund balance in the general fund to use in a budget, an annual budget. And so one of the um, reasons why we would use accumulated fund balance in a budget as a revenue source. So in addition to things like our levy increase, as you just mentioned, our fees that come in, any other transfers that are coming in into the general fund to support the sort of general operations of our government would be to offset one-time spending. This is so that we don't have a levy that impacts property taxpayers in a way that is unpredictable and moving up and down year to year. If there are one-time charges or one-time payments that are required, which are required every year, um, using one-time uh, accumulated fund balance dollars in the general fund is appropriate so that we can maintain a steady property tax um, for our property taxpayers. So every year we do an analysis just looking at what is our financial policies, which our financial policies state that we have 17% of our planned spending for the next year reserved and unobligated in our general fund before we start that year. Now that percentage um, is our policy and we are generally well above it. 17% is kind of on the low end of uh, just looking at similarly situated cities. So typically we are between 20 and 30%. This year we are, uh, there are some one-time expenditures that made sense to use a little bit more than our sort of traditional planning amount for uh, accumulated fund balance. And so that's sort of all of that happened in uh, the spring and summer when we are putting together our recommendations and then ultimately the mayor's recommended budget. Um, so this year just to get a couple of um, facts out <laughs> into the public record, we are, uh, we're gonna end the year um, with a well above our financial uh, policy of 17%. If we make it through 2020 and spend down the 17 million that we have planned, we will be at about 20% of our operating budget in reserves. So we'll have about 13 million above our fund balance policy as breathing room. If we increase that amount, we'll be even closer to our financial policy and that just lowers the, the uh, cushion that we have before we run up against our financial policies. So I think that uh, that's all for me, just talking about the, the policies and best practices that we apply when we do this. And I will stand by for any further questions. Thank you. We have a lot of additional people in queue here. Um, I also put myself in queue. Um, I do want to speak to this. Um, I support most of the items in this amendment, and I believe they're all strong candidates for other ARP funding. And I also appreciate the difficulty that Director Cotton um, 
said that comes with money with different government strings, different levels of government strings attached. Um, but it is only because of the source here that I really cannot support this amendment. I cannot support any amendment that would place our city in a state of financial instability when we're working diligently to recover from the financial crisis caused by the still ongoing global pandemic and more. Our, our general fund is exactly that, or our general reserve fund is exactly that. It's a reserve. It's our emergency fund, which is not a rainy day fund, as some have suggested in the past. This reserve and the healthiness of it is a significant component to our bond rating. And it's a big part of the financial outlook that bond agencies assign us. Uh, we responsibly manage it in coordination with responsibly planning out our legal obligations in order to pay for them and not have shocks to our system. It is the padding for shocks to our system. Why would we throw that away uh, and jeopardize our financial standing? We don't get to refund this with ARP dollars. Uh, we have the full capability of funding this work in just a few months. Um, heck, we could even run all these items through committee and have real discussion about them along the way. Um, this pandemic is not over. Our expert finance team has projections about where our sales tax revenues might be in the coming year, but none of that is set in stone. We get that data on a two month delay. Meanwhile, we've had our first reported case of a new variant of COVID in our own county just this week. So we don't know when revenues will go back to normal. And that is just a fact. We need to be really thoughtful when we talk about spending our reserves below the recommended threshold. And we should be listening to our finance team and the very detailed letter that they wrote to all of us. They are the financial experts more than any of the 13 of us. This is why we have favorable bond ratings. This is really not how we do the budget. Our CFO literally gives a recommendation that we use to consider and set the levy of the year early in the year. And I just, our council responsibility is this markup process. It's to make tough decisions and choose where to move the mayor's priorities. But choosing instead to avoid a hard decision, to make a short term and financially irresponsible decision is not good governing. And I would go so far as to implore my colleagues not to start rating this as some kind of newfound money that um, is just available for all of our wishes and needs. We need to do better than this on sources of money. And I've never seen this being taken as a source before, but I would really stress that we not do this. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious, I know that um, the Health Department um, submitted a grant application for recast dollars. I'm just curious what where that is in the process, if we uh, have been awarded those funds, which I'm not positive, but if we have any sense of where we are in that process. With, with permission, this is Gretchen Musicant. I can answer Go ahead. that question. Yep. Uh, we have recently heard that we were not funded. We were not selected for that. Thank you. Council Vice President Jenkins, is that your only question at that in this moment? Yes, that is. Thank you. Council Member Cano. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about my thinking on this <clears throat> particular amendment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, you know, I'm doing a little bit of uh, self -re reflection here in terms of um, the body of work that the city of Minneapolis leads on this front, which of course has been evolving and improving over the last at least, you know, eight to nine years that I've been involved with the city. Um, it was under Mayor Betsy Hodges that um, I first got 
a um, up close glance and ability to work on community funded strategies to address crime and safety and livability issues in neighborhoods. Um, and in general, since that time, we've really struggled as a city to function in the space of being a grantor or like um, an investor in these initiatives, as well as um, an organization that can provide due diligence follow up in evaluating those initiatives and um, and making sure that they're working, that they're having the intended impact and um, and really being open and transparent about how those evaluation uh, mechanisms are coming together. Um, so so as I think about this work, I think about the juncture in time that we're in, which is of course December of uh, a council cycle that is ending with new council members um, waiting at the doorstep to to take their seat in our offices and um, in a very high profile community driven um, work uh, work group that the mayor has put together on community safety with reputable voices um, such as Nikima Levy Pounds as well as uh, Sheila Nazad and, and many, many others. And so as, as I look at, at this work, I really feel like it's important for the city to um, take the time to allow the investments that we made last year and a couple of months ago and the year before to fully mature and to, to settle in the organization so we can fully integrate them across all the departments that they need to be touching and collaborating with. Um, you know, our, our CPSs, our crime prevention specialists are still very much in a, in a state of um, both uncertainty and transition. And, um, and I share that to, to express that it's hard for the enterprise to really um, hit that cadence and that rhythm that it needs to be able to deliver these programs in, in a way that is, that is hitting the mark. And so uh, I, I want, you know, my desire is to allow those investments that we've made to mature to, um, and I'll speak to myself right here, <laughs> to um, just sort of stop having this kind of knee jerk reaction to just dumping money at the problem without having uh, a planful, thoughtful approach at, 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 what, at what we need to be doing. And, and again, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of the, the action steps that I've taken this year and, um, you know, thinking through uh, the efficacy of those um, actions and, and really understanding evaluation and the role that um, the lessons learned plays in what we do next. Um, you know, I myself have probably spent five years working on a specific initiative, um, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program, which was initially brought forward by Susan Siegel, who was, uh, you know, then our city attorney and eventually evolved, evolved and um, iterated to the point where uh, community members and foundations and others stepped up to, to carry that conversation um, because we at the city got distracted with so many other pro uh, programs and initiatives that we wanted to explore and experiment with. Um, and so I just, I just want to share that I, I would prefer that these kinds of investments uh, and ideas and initiatives uh, be vetted by the work group that the mayor has put together uh, because it is sort of a, a bigger space of accountability where these discussions can happen that are going to hopefully be more and better supported by community leaders and community residents who um, essentially ran a campaign on this for the last you know 12 to, to two years. Um, and even more, if you consider the days when um, Knock was alive and well, and, and they started to publicly coin the narrative of um, community safety beyond policing. And, and so this, this is a, a very uh, dynamic and complex and, and large field of, of inquiry in terms of the kinds of initiatives and interventions the city can do. So I, I think I would prefer that these kinds of things, again, um, be presented to the work group that the mayor has put together 
um, around public safety and reform for the police department and maybe other systems at the city, make sure that it's been well uh, in, in well alignment with the restructuring of our local city governance um, when voters approved question number one this uh, past December. And, um, and, I, and I would be interested in maybe seeing a different source. Uh, and maybe there can be different ways to, to come up with, um, you know, sources from, from different parts of the enterprise. Um, but, but I think sequentially, to me, it makes the most, um, the most sense from an efficacy perspective, from a lessons learned perspective, and from a sustainability perspective, to really package these kinds of decisions, investments, and strategies with a, a well thought out uh, plan, you know, multi-year plan. Uh, it would be great if we could think about these initiatives from a 20 year perspective, a little bit more like the comprehensive plan versus a 12 month cycle, um, which is one of the reasons why I supported uh, the biennial uh, budgeting process instead of every 12 years asking your community members to do something different or sing a different song or jump higher or jump lower. Um, it, it just it just feels like it's a little bit of a disservice to those efforts when we don't allow our city staff and the community partners that we're funding uh, through these resources to mature in their practice, in their design, and to be able to implement lessons learned and evaluations that can inform um, some of these ideas and initiatives. And if that body of work does exist, you know, I would love to have been exposed to that before today's vote. Um, because, because I don't, I don't think I can support this, um, given the the lack of alignment that I see, and understanding that you know two to three weeks from now, uh, there's going to be um, other people heavily involved in these conversations that um, should be at the table and making these decisions and mapping out that 20 year future of public safety for our city. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of my thinking on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you for all of this discussion around these. I don't know that there is um, any controversy in terms of these kinds of things being needed. Uh, we have some concerns with how fast we can stand up and operationalize this money as we have in the past. Um, I appreciate that, um, and I hear you, Director Cotton, when you talk about how hard it is to use public money uh, and to do so in a, in a way where we're quickly trying to stand up these programs. Um, using a general fund reserve balance also helps us do things like avoid layoffs. It helps us avoid wage freezes is a, and it's a tool for us to deal with, you know, the, the bigger picture and um, financial crises. The mayor in his comments uh, made it very clear that he felt all of this was a ARPA um, American Federal Reserve Act money eligible. Um, are you set on using this source or would you be open to reworking this motion with a different source of funding um, for all of motion 11 at this time? Oh, I'm sorry. I also didn't realize there were some other people in queue. Um, so that's my that's my question. If you're ready to answer it now, great. Otherwise, I, I'd invite, I'll bring the other people back into the queue and then come back. Madam Chair, I can, I can address that as um, this was, the discussion was going, we were hearing the feedback. Councilmember Cunningham and I have emailed a version of this amendment that uses ARPA phase two for this entire motion. Um, we did also use that funding source recently through the POGO process for a couple of other items. I'm glad to hear that the mayor is supportive of that approach. I'm glad to hear so many council members are supportive of this motion. Um, together with finance, we've prepared that, which is ready now and has been emailed to the council and to the clerks. I'd be happy to formally move that as a substitute based on the feedback that you've heard. That. Uh, I just want um, to be clear that I don't support waiting for an ambiguous future date during which this may be or may not be proposed. Um, there has been no public proposal of ARPA phase two. So um, the intention of Councilmember Cunningham and I is to make this decision as part of the 2022 budget so that our Office of Violence Prevention and Office of Performance Innovation can continue this work without interruption with the resources that they need to do the work in the same way that every other city department um, needs and deserves to be treated. 
And we still have not heard from Mr. Smith. Could we please pause and let him speak to the second piece of this um, issue? I think it will address actually a lot of what we've been hearing from council members who may not be on the public safety committee or maybe have missed those presentations that have been coming throughout the term. Sure. Um, with apologies to the people that were in queue, um, Thank you. So I also heard Councilmember Cunningham speaking in the background. Councilmember Cunningham, you are also on board with moving this as a substitute. Did I hear that right? Yes, I'm sorry. I seconded it just in case it needed that. Got it. Thank you. Um, so what you see before you um, has a whole different source of money. It uses the ARPA money, the American Rescue Plan Act money, unobligated um, monies within that balance um, and I will invite Mr. Smith to speak to the second part of this amendment, the part that's on the bottom that says part two. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. So much has been said since uh, I thought I was going to go behind Director Cott that a little bit of my thoughts have been lost, but I wrote some things down to kind of ground people in what um, my team does and why there is an ask for some additional resources. Uh, so as everyone knows, we've done, we're responsible. I have a team of five that are responsible for performance management for all 22 departments with 127 program areas. And we've done a rigorous metric selection process with them, uh, been engaged with our budget office so that council members and the mayor can make uh, informed decisions based on performance uh, policy decisions and budget decisions. We have an evaluation function in the city, which a lot of council members have spoken to through this process. Uh, we work on innovation projects uh, and we use our innovation process to go and do a lot of the work that we do. But we also are working on our work work cities. The city now has a work work city certification and we have to continue to do work on that to make sure that we keep our certification current. And we offer human centered design trainings to the entire city enterprise. And outside of all of that, we were all asked to do a heavy lift with public safety initiatives, which has resulted in the three alternative responses to police that exists in the city so far, which is transferring calls from 911 to 311 theft and report only, so police don't have to go to those. The overnight traffic um, response that's happening out of public works, I'm sorry, out of uh, regulatory services, as well as the mobile behavioral health teams that will be on the street uh, this month. When we um, we're also tasked with looking at all of the problem niche codes uh, in the city, which would, which is also being done with those five staff, to look at what police absolutely have to respond to, of course, by state statute, and then to give people some recommendations and give people an idea of what other problem nature codes exist and what should probably still be handled by police and those that can be uh, handled with an alternative response. Throughout that process, We've not um, been given any additional funding to do that. Uh, and in order to engage community members and internal and external stakeholders in the process, we need funding to do so, so that we can prototype and pilot all of the things that we bring forward for recommendations that the city council and the mayor would like to um, see move forward. But right now there are no funds dedicated to doing any of that work outside of the ongoing funding that has been dedicated to the mobile behavioral health uh, teams that will be going out on the street. And so if we are to follow the process, which um, Council Member Connell actually explained re really well, with doing research, different iterations, prototyping and piloting and engaging the community so that we can co-build these solutions, the only way we can do that is with funding and right now uh, my staff has been asked to do a lot and in doing so we had to drop some innovation projects we had to drop some of our evaluation function um, projects and other projects
because we were happy to take this on. But what it's doing is if we can't get additional funding to continue this work, then I'm not saying that we can't do it, but the scale at which we can do it and the pace at which we can do it will literally be diminished if we can't get a, additional resources. And so I'm not aware of anybody else in the city who's looking at the problem nature codes in this way so that we can begin to figure out what type of alternatives we will be offering, if any at all, but prevention and reform are two things of the three prong approach that we were talking about. And it seems that right now, I've not had any conversations with many people about um, ARPA funds being a source for this, but if that's an option, we're all for it. But I just wanted to let people know what we're doing what we were charged with doing by this council and what we'd like to continue to do, but we need the resources to do it. And so if, that, if anybody has any questions about that, then I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe next in queue is council member Gordon and council member Gordon. I'm sorry it's taken so long to get to you. I do know no, that I'm there are some of our. Here. I'm actually next in queue. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Cunningham, and I do want to note that we have a number of people in queue um, and we are going to start losing some colleagues um, in not very long for other meetings, but um, perhaps we can still take care of this and dispense with this motion today. So Council Member Cunningham, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there was just a lot of incorrect information that was pontificated by um, previous council members who spoke. So I just um, wanted to to make clear that um, there may be council members who haphazardly throw money at problems without intentionality, but that is not the way that I operate and that's not the way Council President Bender has, has operated. Um, you know, I've been doing this work for six years and only bring forward work that's thought out and based on research. Um, I really you know, just ask my like for folks to to not see these as nice little additions or um, things that you know that we want rather than need. Um, we need this, and one of the um, things that I want to uh, just make sure uh, folks understand is um, that the reason why it's so hard sometimes for OBP to get the money out um, to contracts with community-based organizations is because of our own financial policies um, and uh, like procurement or contracting, excuse me, like processes um, that, you know, I've been trying to figure out, I've been trying to help, I've been trying to, you know, th there have been multiple of us who have been trying to work through that. That is not at the fault of the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, that is um, our own financial policies getting in the way of um, quickly and effectively funding um, and paying community members to do work that the city is not doing. Um, and so this process takes a long time. So I ask for my colleagues to please support this amended, um, this amendment, amended amendment um, with this funding source. We cannot wait a few months um, to begin the process of possibly funding this. Um, summer comes every single year and the evidence and research is abundantly clear that every single summer, whenever it gets hot, violent crime goes up. And so we cannot wait until like March to start having the conversations about what are we gonna do or what is the city going to do um, for the summer so this is meant uh, to get a running head start um, to prepare uh, for that spike by doing the work now um, immediately. So, um, and, and to also just share, we funded in last year's budget an epidemiologist in the Office of Violence Prevention to be able to help with um, evaluation um, and impact of the uh, $250,000 to purchase and license a programs information system that also is evaluation based. Um, that evaluation is inherently built into the public health approach. Um, and so, so that is something that we have been doing. Um, you know, 
we created space in the Public Health and Safety Committee um, over the last year and a half um, for all of this information to be brought forward. Almost nothing here is new. Um, and so I just wanna, wanna really share that component of it. Um, I, this is work that I've been doing for years. I've worked closely with city staff. Council President Bender has as well. Um, we have the work here in front of us asking a committee of folks who are not public health experts, who are not um, in the nitty gritty in this kind of way, that just kicks this down the road when we know that this works. So I'll just leave it at that and ask for folks to please support this um, updated amendment because the urgency is there. I cannot in, I cannot um, stand by while you know we talk about financial policies and we talk about fiscal responsibility, but yet we're not doing everything we can right now to address children being killed, violence happening, gunshots, um, and just saying, well, we'll do that in a couple of months. Um, we have to do this now. And so I ask for folks to please support this amendment. Thank you. Just making sure I have the people in queue right. Um, we have Council President Bender and then Council Member Gordon and then Council Member Fletcher in queue and then Council Member Cano with a question. Uh, Council Member Bender, did you have anything more to add? No, I'm good. I jumped in to answer your question, so. Thank you, Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much and I'll be supporting this motion. I was actually ready to support the original motion and I wasn't necessarily when I first saw it because I was concerned about the cash on hand, but it was clear to me after talking to finance staff that even when we took the 3.5 million for these uses, we were still above our 17% policy. And so what I would suggest is when we set those policies, we should be real about them. We should honor them. Um, and then we shouldn't set them at some percentage and then think, but we really think we should have 6% more in, on hand, but we're not gonna make that our policy because it makes it harder to make decisions. So. I don't think this this budget cycle we're necessarily going to be contemplating changing the 17 percent, but people should know that um, even with this, we still would have been at over 18 percent, um, according to finance staff and the information I got. So I appreciate that, and um, if it were up to me, I would suggest maybe we should bump it up to 20 percent. Thank you, Councilmember Gordon, and I do think that's a good idea. Um, but I don't know that we can change that in, in the short run here. We've just never come close to having a problem with it um, before, but it's certainly something that I have written down uh, from this since last night that we really need to look at in the, in the future. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. I'll be very brief because uh, I think most of uh, what I would have wanted to say is covered, but I, I do just want to, if any of my colleagues are feeling like this has not been presented or discussed in committee, I would encourage you to go back and watch some of the PHS committee uh, meetings uh, where we have gotten regular updates from uh, from this department about both the things they've currently enacted, many of which uh, they enacted in a small way and this is and these items are expanding uh, and about their future plans. I think this has been more discussed in committee than many of the items that we have already voted to approve today and, and is being done in a very planful way. Uh, you know, Councilmember Cunningham deserves a lot of credit in his role as chair for really curating that conversation to make sure that this has gotten uh, a lot of public discussion and a lot of uh, uh, public attention and opportunity for comment and and uh, for people to understand these programs. So I'm very excited to support them today. Uh, we really can't do it soon enough. Uh, I'm not going to be the one next term getting the calls about uh, you know violence over the summer, but uh, for these to have a chance of getting up and running uh, in time to make an impact next year, we really do have to pass them now and uh, I encourage everyone to support. Thank you. Next in queue, we have Councilmember Cano with a question for staff. Wonderful, thank you. And you know, I didn't mean to have, um, you know, a few council members trying to mansplain to me like what's been happening with this public discussion. It's great that the public conversation is happening. The question is the metrics, the evaluation, the impact. And so, um, you can just go out into the community and find out if these things have been working or not. I get it. Um, 
we won't be the people taking these calls next year and the calls will come with or without these investments. Um, so it is kind of a, yeah, just a, a continued dialogue on this front. Um, I do have a question for the director of um, budget. So if uh, this allocation moves forward today, which would be 3.5 million, how much would be left in the ARPA phase two funds that are supposed to be allocated with community input uh, this next uh, spring? Director Thank Kruber. You. Yep. Thank you for the question, Chair, uh, uh, Council Member Cano and Chair Palmasano. Uh, so currently we have $38 million that is unobligated in our ARPA fund. This would bring us down to $34.9 million. We expect to have more than that available for phase two appropriations. And that's because in between now and when those recommendations are made, we will have a rollover process where we will be taking a look at how departments are performing, how they're able to spend dollars. Some departments have run into roadblocks or eligibility issues as they've tried to set up, set up their programs and start spending those dollars. So we will be monitoring that, um, doing a rollover process, like I said, between December and January. We expect that some dollars will be canceled to the bottom line of that fund and available for reappropriation. So 34.9 million is sort of the minimum amount. We expect there to be more. And so one, one example would be for several of the ARPA uh, proposals in round one, we uh, included staff dollars for folks for the next three years. And if those staff maybe have not been hired yet or will, will be hired in December, then that the budget that was unspent from uh, that would be spent on hiring someone from July through December would be canceled to the bottom line and we could reappropriate it. And that's really important for these funds just because of the timeline that we have on spending them. Four years feels like a long time, but it is really important that we are focused on uh, getting that money out the door. So 34 million is the bottom line. We expect there to be more after that rollover process. Could you just kind of uh, prognosticate how much rollover uh, funding we're expecting? Will it be like $1 million or more like $10 million? It is very hard to say right now. I think um, just in the staffing costs um, for staff positions that were appropriated but have not been filled yet, I would imagine we'd get at least a million dollars. Um, when we get into the rest of the programs that may or may not be started, um, I don't have a good figure right now. We expect to have good information on that shortly and then final information in January. Um, but a million dollars is a safe bet, I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next in queue, we have Council President Bender and then Council Member Johnson. And then I would ask that I think that we're ready to um, ask the clerk to call the roll on this item. Council President Bender. Thanks, Madam Chair. I appreciate the support that has been voiced for this important investment in public safety. I have to say of all the things I will, um, you know, as I am happily retiring from the City Council, I will miss these discussions the least. I have been involved in bringing or supporting amendments to the budget related to public safety. Um, using, you know, change from the couch cushions, using MPD as a funding source, using various funding sources, everything from tiny amounts of money like $10,000 to um, more significant investments. And it always seems to descend into name calling and um, the th kind of political posturing that doesn't happen with any other topic. And it disappoints me every single time. Like all of those previous proposals, this one was developed in good faith. This was developed through careful work over many years by staff in the city of Minneapolis, multiple national consultants. And I really wish that our city council would stop insulting the integrity of this work over and over and over again. If you don't like the council members who are bringing the amendments, bring them yourselves, um, but stop insulting the staff and the work um, for to score political points. It's, it's ridiculous and it needs to stop. Um, this is a, a common sense investment in important public safety that everyone says when they're talking is unanimously supported. This is such a good idea. We love this both and whatever, whatever. And then when we come to actually making the investments and actually making the proposals, um, we see the kind of ugliness that um, 
has no place in this kind of discussion. Uh, so please, um, as this work continues, I really hope folks will take the time to speak to the staff who are leading this work, to attend the committee meetings and take the time to listen to the hours of careful presentation. This level of scrutiny, scrutiny is not applied to any other function of the city and certainly not to the police department, which is ending this year with a $5 million surplus. Councilmember Cunningham and Hyam and I could have used that as a funding source, uh, but we didn't want to create a bunch of drama and division, um, which apparently is unavoidable because I think at the end of the day, there are council members who are saying they support this work, but no matter how it is presented, no matter what words are used, no matter what funding source, you always find some way to pick it apart and to criticize it and not just criticize the work, criticize the people who are using it in employing name calling and other kinds of things that really have no place. So I just couldn't let this go without saying that I don't think that the conversations that this council has descended into whenever it discusses public safety are reflective of the kind of body that people espouse to be a part of, want to be a part of. I have done an enormous amount of work over the past four years to try to mitigate that, to have conversations with people. And I'm, I'm sad to see that it just cannot stop no, no matter what approach is taken. I hope my colleagues will support this today. If you don't, that's fine. If you don't agree with this, just vote no. Um, but please stop insulting the staff and the national consultants and the work that has been going on for years. Council Member Johnson, did you want to go next? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to say I appreciate the authors for switching the source on this. I had concerns around the original source, uh, but this certainly, I think, resolves those concerns. I also appreciate the inclusion of the funding for OPI to continue the work uh, to prototype out uh, additional programs here that can really uh, help in the larger picture. So I appreciate the motion. I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Um, and as I mentioned, my issue and um, arguments here were truly about the source of this money. I am glad we've dispensed with people in this discussion and I will invite the clerk to please call the roll on this last motion for budget markup. Council Member Reich. Aye. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. That motion carries and I think that is a nice um, point of agreement to end on. Um, so let's just see. We have dispensed with all of the amendments that are ready to come here today. I'm just checking all of the cues. Um, so with that colleagues, we've completed the packet of fully prepared amendments. Um, I don't, I'm hearing from budget staff that they don't think that Monday's meeting is necessary. They were able to do this work and switch the source. Thank you for being so nimble um, on your feet. So instead of adjourning, I'm going to go so far as to move approval of the 2022 budget as listed on the agenda and as amended by this body today. This motion formally forwards the 2022 budget package to the December 8th City Council meeting. Um, I do have a question about that, which is since we've changed the source on this last one to use ARPA money, uh, do we need to take some separate, do we have to send that somewhere separate from here? Because this is then the last budget committee meeting of the year. I'll invite the city clerk or director Kruver to weigh in on that. Um, the city clerk says, no, the whole packet goes to the adjourned council meeting. So this last piece will be included in that packet. Is there any further discussion? Council member Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to mention quickly that um, I'll be bringing forward an amendment at that Wednesday meeting. Uh, it's actually something I've been working on this week with uh, for starting at the beginning of the week 
with Director Kruver and uh, with department leadership as well. It's a minor amendment for $30,000 uh, related to leadership development for the next council uh, and mayor to tap into uh, just so we can continue finding ways to uh, work as well as possible as a body. I know there's a lot of work the staff have been uh, doing on this as well that's supportive of that direction and uh, look forward to bringing that forward. But I did want to mention it since it was just one of these things with all these other amendments uh, that it, we we had language essentially ready or, or near ready uh, late last night after working on it all week, but uh, it was just very last uh, minute with everything else going on and thought, oh, this can frankly wait until Wednesday. So I know I worked with you, Madam Chair, on um, that uh, timeline change around that, but just didn't want anyone to be surprised. And then I will send that out before uh, Wednesday's meeting as well. So everyone gets a chance to uh, review in advance. Thank you. Other items we are sending forward until next Wednesday, you might remember early on in today's meeting um, was a note from Council Member Fletcher uh, talking about his desire to add potentially some additional money for the labor standards co-enforcement teams. Um, and then also I, we will have to see what Council Member Osmond wishes to do with his proposal that he wasn't able to bring forward himself today. So those things will go to Wednesday. Um, and I will invite the clerk to call the roll on this motion that will send everything to full council. Council member Reich. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Cunningham. Aye. Ellison. Aye. Osman. Goodman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Cano. Aye. Bender. Aye. Schrader. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. I do want to go back. I. I did not see, sometimes I get these in packs of three. It does look like Council Vice President Jenkins was in queue. Um, did you have something that you wanted to say before I finish off my script and cancel Monday's meeting? You actually answered my question. It was around Council Member Osmond's uh, motion. Um, I do want to just um, state that um, I, I am I'm proud to um, support this budget and thank all my colleagues for their very thoughtful um, considerations of all the issues that we have um, discussed, continued to work on, propose, um, setting ourselves up for um, success in, in the upcoming um, council term um, and, and subsequent years. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. I like ending on that note. This motion uh, before us that the clerk called the roll on carries the 2022 budget package is referred to the adjourned meeting of the city council scheduled for this coming Wednesday, December 8th at 6.05 p.m. As we have dispensed with our markup of the 2022 budget, I will formally direct the clerk to proceed with canceling budget committee meeting uh, that was scheduled for December 6th at 1.30 and to send out notice of this cancellation. Seeing no further business before us and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you everyone. <laughs>